The first day I transformed into a red evil dragon. I was asked by dragon dad and dragon mom to find 365 dragon wives, all because I awakened the more children, more blessings system. The more offspring I have, the more abilities I will have. The stronger the quality of the offspring, the stronger my power will be. However, more than 20 years have passed, and I still haven't found a wife. In a fit of anger, Dragon Dad and Dragon Mom left home overnight. In order to quickly marry a wife and please my parents, I set my sights on an adult Red Dragon Sister. Red Dragon Sister, I feel you can give birth to sons, would you consider being my wife? But before I could finish speaking, the Red Dragon Sister looked at me as if hit by a burst of flames. After a few minutes, my whole body was in a sorry state, my dragon scales were badly damaged, and my dragon wings on my back were tattered like torn paper. The adolescent red dragon is really over the top. If she disagrees, she just disagrees, she just ended up beating me up. Do you know what a great impact it had on my young heart? I limped through the mountains, cursing with the dirtiest words in my mouth. Yet this adolescent red dragon directly took away the territory I had painstakingly built. Now, I'm no different from being dead, seriously injured and not yet an adult. Those who follow their own monster soldiers are killed to the last man. If a high-level monster were to attack me at this time, I estimate that it would be a full meal of dragon meat. Great Red Dragon Majesty, where should we go next? Seeing me in a rage at this moment, the leader of the jackal people, Chris, on the side, also began to ask hesitantly. As we are now, we have no territory, no strength, and no resources. The most powerful Red Dragon Majesty has also injured them severely. The remaining monster followers, not taking advantage of the situation, are already very loyal. It's getting dark, find a cave to rest. I didn't vent my anger on Chris. Chris is the first jackal leader I encountered after leaving the lair. Faced with my arrival, Chris chose to be loyal without hesitation and became a servant of the Red Dragon. In the eyes of monsters, following the Great Dragon, they are a member of the Dragon Clan, a noble symbol. And only by following the dragon can they seek more opportunities. Otherwise, the bloodlines of wild monster tribes limit their own development. Faced with this loyal subordinate, it's impossible to drive them away, let alone release my anger for no reason. I can't chill the hearts of my subordinates, even though I am a red dragon, I must understand this. The ultimate reason for this defeat is that I was too weak. If I want to become stronger, I can only quickly find a partner and then have offspring. Find another partner, and continue to have offspring. We must remember the grudge against Chris today, we must avenge it. Once I find a few partners, I will have several offspring. Let's go back and kill them. My sudden words left Chris stunned. What nonsense, finding a partner to have offspring. Although she knows that the dragon values this aspect, now is obviously not the time to do such a thing. But seeing my serious expression, Chris could only nod in response. After finding a cave to live in for the night, my damaged wounds have all been repaired, and the lost scales have also grown new dragon scales. Growing at an extremely fast speed, just like bamboo shoots after the rain, this self-repair speed is also the abnormality of a dragon. If I had eaten something to replenish my strength last night, my recovery speed would have been faster. I stretched lazily and walked out of the cave, ordered Chris to continue on the road with the remaining werewolves. The red dragon I provoked yesterday has already occupied my territory. To avoid that menopausal red dragon, trying to exterminate us. We must leave this mountain range. But we haven't gone far yet. Chris suddenly shouted, respected red dragon majesty, I smell the scent of humans. Are you sure? I furrowed my brow. Although the dragon's sense of smell is a hundred times stronger than that of werewolves. But I have never seen a human from birth until now, which also means I cannot analyze the human scent in the air. Chris nodded vigorously, I have seen humans before, I am absolutely sure. There are three different scents in the air and there is also the smell of blood. Not far from us, let's go and see this group of humans. I instantly became interested. We just suffered a defeat, we must win a battle to solidify our position in the werewolf's hearts. A lofty and formidable position. Now just three humans, and one of them is injured. I am very confident that I can easily handle them. As long as there is no forbidden curse among them, any mage will do. After a dozen minutes, three figures appeared in front of me. Two heavily armored guards, covered in wounds, were very vigilant, looking around. Between the two of them, was an extremely noble-looking young lady. Eat the men, leave the woman, at my command. The jackal werewolves swarmed out like unsheathed swords. As nearly a hundred werewolves charged, the two guards quickly drew their weapons and shields, and charged. Even if the two are the strongest among humans. But now, facing the siege of more than eighty werewolves, they still ended up lying in a pool of blood. 
The girl raised her wand to cast a spell, but after continuous fleeing, her magic within had long been depleted. Watching the werewolves around her staring viciously, the girl's legs gave way, sitting on the ground, trembling all over, she closed her eyes, waiting for death. But then, at this moment, a gust of wind swept in, and the werewolves that had been surrounding her growled, and then disappeared. Sensing something unusual, the girl slowly opened her eyes, but what met her eyes was a gigantic dragon, towering like a sand dune, its crimson scales reflecting red light in the sunlight. The girl's face instantly turned pale. At this moment, the girl's despair deepened. She couldn't understand why she had encountered a dragon here, and not just any dragon, but the most ferocious and violent red dragon. The red dragon, known as one of the five chromatic dragons, with the most violent temperament, basically, no one can survive in its presence. I, with a pair of dark red eyes, gazed at the girl in front of me. All the monsters around put down the food in their mouths, and knelt down one by one. I offer the highest respect to your majesty. The dragon horn swept back, as if it were a crown on my head. The intimidating aura of the dragon swept over me, like an incoming tide, leaving everyone breathless. Tell me your name, human. My deep and resonant voice emanated from my mouth. I looked down from a high vantage point at the girl in front of me. From my perspective as a human in my previous life, very beautiful. Finally, not a scoundrel like the jackal people. My name is Sylvia. Sylvia was a little dazed. She was a bit surprised. The red dragon, surprisingly, did not choose to strike her down at the first moment, but instead asked for her name. This is slightly different from the rumors about the red dragon. Sylvia, a very nice name. Do you want to live? I nodded slightly, then asked again. Yes, I want to live. Sylvia's originally lifeless eyes suddenly lit up. As if seeing hope for life again, she hurriedly raised her head and looked up at the red dragon in front of her. She was originally a princess of the human kingdom. A few days ago, the country was invaded and conquered. Her father fought with all his might to carve out an escape route for her. This escape route was paved by hundreds, if not thousands, of people for her. She also bears the mission of revitalizing the kingdom and seeking revenge for these people. She cannot die on the path of escape. She must survive. It's good to become my partner. You will then have the right to survive. I don't want to beat around the bush. I directly stated the conditions. Becoming your partner, becoming the partner of the Red Dragon, Sylvia was stunned. She never expected the conditions of the Red Dragon to be like this. Looking at my huge body, Sylvia blushed slightly and nodded. After nodding in response to my satisfaction, she formally left. Until my figure completely disappeared, Sylvia couldn't believe it. Everything she had just experienced. The dragon not only didn't kill her, but instead accepted her as a partner. All of this is simply too surreal. At the same time, she kept asking herself in her heart. Can she endure being the partner of such a powerful red dragon? Leader Chris, should we still eat this human? Jackal, lightly nudged Chris's arm with his elbow. Pointing at Sylvia, he asked excitedly. Humph, Chris angrily punched the guy next to him, is there something wrong with your head? She is already the partner of the Red Dragon Majesty. You little rascals better show some respect at this moment. The rest of the monsters finally reacted, crazily butting their heads. Respected Mother Sylvia, I'm very sorry for staring you just now. Please forgive me. Chris nod on the hard bone in his mouth and walked up to Sylvia to apologize. Who would have thought that Sylvia would eventually become our own mother? If she had known, she would have made her little brother be gentler just now. On the other hand, I am not hungry. After confirming that Sylvia is willing to be my partner, I will fly a little further alone. Observing the nearby plains and forests, I confirmed that this is unclaimed territory. I started considering whether to re-establish my territory here. Although, I am closer to the territory of that menopausal red dragon. But if I become stronger, it's also best for revenge. I can gather and strike back, but... If that menopausal red dragon wants to expand again, there might be another conflict. After all, the distance is too close. For safety's sake, I have decided to move further away. Sometimes it's best to let bygones be bygones, but not too far. Controlling a reasonable distance is enough. Respected red dragon, we have arrived. Chris, at this moment, is leading the monsters to catch up. Sylvia is running at the forefront, panting, with a rosy complexion. As a magician. My physical strength naturally can't compare to this group of monsters. Sylvia, you said you are the princess of the kingdom of Alea. I glanced at the beautiful girl behind you. When Sylvia was accepted as a companion ahead, she roughly told me about her situation. Revenge? Interesting, she happens to have an enemy too. Your majesty, the red dragon, Sylvia nodded nervously. Facing a dragon for the first time. Where would she find the courage to face the dragon directly? 
Although the dragon ahead said that becoming her companion could survive and seek revenge, but who knows if the dragon is joking. The green dragon, one of the five colored dragons, what it likes the most is to play games with intelligent creatures, carrying a map on its body. Sylvia nodded, quickly took out a map from the pocket of her skirt, took out a map. The writing on the map is in the common language of the continent, which I can read. From this map, I roughly understand the nearby forces, plains, and mountains, a human map is more convenient. In the end, I set the destination in a nearby mountain. It's a bit of a distance from the so-called Kingdom of Alea, just conveniently far away from that menopausal red dragon. Give me time to grow, with a mighty roar, the dragon's chant spread far and wide. I stir the enormous red dragon wings, grabbing Sylvia beside me, leading the remaining monsters to what I believed was the destination. Two days later, during this time, Chris and the others went through a day of long journey. Finally arrived at a place called the Dokafa Mountains. It took a whole day, the jackal people finally dug out a cave after much effort, providing a residence for the red dragon, while also instructing Chris to lead the remaining monsters, launching an attack on the surrounding monster tribes, beginning to expand my territory and recruit more subordinates. Under a qualified young red dragon, the number of monsters should be at least in the thousands. Just the current group of jackal people and wolf-like monsters, the number does not match my status at all. Before, I had nearly 2,000 monsters. Unfortunately, it was taken out by that menopausal red dragon. Now I must start expanding, and at the same time, I also begin to prepare my breeding plan. I called Sylvia over, she probably guessed what would happen next. My dragon wings spread out, a faint majesty spreading from my body, to ensure that we won't be disturbed by some monsters in the future. Without saying a word, I set up some forbidden magic in my cave. It can prevent the monsters from breaking in, looking at the red dragon in front of us. Sylvia seemed to have seen something. A blush instantly appeared on her fair little face. Over the next month, led by Chris, the jackal people, started a frenzy of invasion against the surrounding monsters, the unstoppable jackal people, causing fear among the other monster tribes, they did not understand. Why the jackal people were so fierce and aggressive, the only thing they knew was. This Dukafar mountain range seemed to have welcomed a real dragon. Despite the losses in the frenzied battle expansion, the jackal people lost many. But this did not stop their momentum, despite the reduced numbers. They would absorb fresh blood from other conquered monster tribes, ensuring ample fighting power. At the same time, I also received good news. That is, Sylvia is pregnant. Detected that the master has conceived the first offspring with human bloodline. Offspring bloodline, human dragon bloodline, S-level magic affinity, and A-level strong physique. The first offspring is so strong, I gently patted Sylvia's head, feeling extremely relieved. You stay in the nest and take good care of yourself. If you want to eat something, just tell Chris. As long as she is in this mountain range, she can definitely get it for you. This is my first offspring, so naturally, I have to pay more attention to it. Once the offspring is born, I can obtain its talents and rewards. Thinking about it, I'm already a little impatient. According to the inheritance of the true dragon in my mind, the offspring of dragons and humans. If the dragon is the mother, it will take five years. If it's a human mother, it only takes one year of pregnancy to give birth. This is still between humans. If it's the breeding between dragons, the time will be longer. Generally, it takes about 10 years of pregnancy to give birth. Understood, I know. Your Majesty, the Red Dragon, Sylvia is very happy. Your Majesty, the Red Dragon, your loyal hound, Chris requests an audience. Just then, outside the magic prohibition, Chris's voice was heard. Come in, I spread my dragon wings and lifted the magic prohibition. And at the same time, let Sylvia test it a little. Chris respectfully knelt down on one knee and paid me the highest respect. She began to report to me about expanding their territory, after a month's time. Chris has already expanded my territory by a full four times. We also recruited many monsters. However, due to the scattered nature of the monster races, Chris didn't report, and the monster races are doing well. Chris, I am very satisfied with you, but your thoughts cannot be concealed. The eye of a true dragon tells me that you have encountered trouble. I am very satisfied with Chris's performance this month. But from Chris's eyes, I sense something different, which made me feel that she is hiding something. Your Majesty, we have encountered a group of goblin tribes. Although their strength poses no threat to us, they were surrounded and annihilated by some forest giant wolf cubs. No matter how well we hide on the ground, they always find our weaknesses. They then broke through our siege, causing us heavy losses. Chris quickly reported the troubles we are currently facing. So far, our clan is doing well everywhere. The only downside is that we don't have any flying combat units. 
This resulted in Chris leading the group in battle against the Imperial tribe. But there is no way to deal with the forest giant cubs in the sky. Even using bows and arrows has little effect, they are too agile. Forest giant eagles? How interesting. My claws lightly tap on the stone slab in front of me, creating small pieces of broken stone. The forest giant eagle is the most frequently encountered flying creature in the plain mountains. They are medium-sized monsters with decent strength. If we can recruit the forest giant eagle, we can add a few flying monster units. We won't end up like Chris has tried this time, unable to deal with flying monsters. Since Chris and the others can't handle this trouble, I'll personally take care of it. I quickly gave the order for Chris to bring his Bonebreaker tribe and accompany me. The rest of the monster tribes will stay behind to protect their Sylvie. Mother, I can't take all the monsters away, or Sylvie in the nest will be in danger. Although there are magic restrictions in place, the magic restrictions held by the young red dragon aren't too strong. They can be broken by a typical high-level mage. The next moment, I spread my fiery dragon wings, covering the sky, and took off. I swooped down towards the forest giant's nest, following the footsteps of his majesty, as Chris's shouts echoed down. The charge horn of the Bonebreaker tribe was sounded once again. Then, a dense crowd of werewolves swarmed towards the direction I charged. At this moment, all the creatures in this mountain range were trembling in fear, understanding in their hearts that the emperor spirits and the giant baby monsters were in for big trouble this time. Going against the dragon clan would be the most foolish decision they could make in their lifetime. The bone crusher tribe treads upon the earth, causing intense tremors, however. At this moment, in an open grassy area in the earth whale territory, a massive gray-brown giant eagle is conversing with an earth whale. The eagle is named Damar, the leader of the eagle clan. The earth whale is named Albert, the leader of this earth whale tribe. The reason why the two great monster races are together is because the recent performance of the Bone Crusher tribe has been too outstanding. If the two tribes don't join forces, they will probably be picked off one by one by those hyena people. A group of wild dogs dare to call themselves the Bone Crusher tribe, and even dare to lie that they are loyal to a dragon, it's absolutely ridiculous. Exactly, if there really were dragons in this mountain range, how could we not know? Just as the two leaders were still celebrating the repelling of the Bone Crusher tribe, a sky-scouting giant baby rapidly swooped down from the sky, reporting to the leader that the pack of wild dogs had come again. The flying forest giant baby, regarding every move on the ground. It can be said that it sees everything. This is also the reason why Chris led the Bone Crusher tribe and failed in three attacks. Whether it's a sneak attack or an encirclement, everything is under the opponent's watchful eyes. The forest giants with a god's eye view, dominating the battlefield. A pack of wild dogs dare to come, and today is the perfect opportunity to wipe them all out. Then we'll divide their territory, the two leaders exchange a glance. They decide to take the initiative. After all, the repeated failed attacks have greatly weakened the Bone Crusher tribe, making it the perfect time to eliminate them. The spirits pick up their weapons and gear up. The forest giants also ascend into the air, preparing for an aerial attack on the Bone Crusher tribe. A few minutes later, the Emperor tribe and the Bone Crusher tribe clashed at the border. Chris, you're really rushing to your death. Today, I'll take you all down at once. Ambert saw Chris for the first time, and immediately began to mock. During the third battle, her spiked club almost took Chris's life. Fortunately, Chris reacted quickly, or his head would have been smashed by the spiked club. The sharp-tongued Chris, who usually talks back, this time didn't, with a mischievous smile on his face. At the same time, did the corner of his eye glance at the forest giants circling in the sky. It looks like those forest giants have come to help Emperor Jing again. Fortunately, this time we have the Great Majesty by our side. They no longer need to guard against the forest giants' attacks like before. Ambert, let me tell you one last time, the Bonebreaker tribe are followers of the True Dragon. Those who are wise will surrender to me. Otherwise, when the Great Dragon Majesty awakens, you will feel the Dragon's Wrath. The True Dragon's Wrath. Chris, don't pretend to be powerful anymore. Even if there really is a dragon, I will gnaw on her bones today. Taste the dragon's flavor. In the face of Chris's words, Ambert is extremely incredulous. He even directly insulted the dragon. In response, Chris not only wasn't angry, but her lips even curled up slightly. In fact, this statement was directed at the nearby hidden majesty of the red dragon. Ambert, you will understand the consequences of speaking carelessly. Wolf cubs, chop up their bones for me. The wolf beneath Chris let out a series of low growls, baring its sharp teeth, as soon as the words fell. The jackal wolf riders, mounted on their steeds, charged forward, swinging their axes. The rest of the jackal merchants ran frantically behind, closely following. The experienced warriors charged forward, 
and Ambert also issued the command to charge. As the forest giants in the sky saw the battle commence, they were about to prepare to play their part. A mighty dragon's might surges through the sky, like a tide capable of submerging the earth, sweeping in, causing the forest giants to tremble in their souls, their minds plunged into blankness. Their imposing manner suppressed them, rendering them unable to move. Most of the forest giants, frightened to the point of forgetting how to fly, fell from the sky. In the next moment, a massive figure, glowing red, descends in the center of the battlefield. Who was it just now, who wanted to crush my bones, who wanted to taste the flavor of a real dragon? The dragon is a red evil dragon. As my enormous red figure enters the center of the battlefield, a terrifying majesty inherent to dragons, sweeping across the land, like a blade piercing the battlefield, causing all the hostile monsters present to fall into terror. In the second that Chris catches the emperor's leader off guard, his mouth curls, revealing his sharp fangs. Gripping the hilt with both hands, he aims a blow at the emperor's leader's neck. Scalding blood gushes from the emperor's leader's neck, followed by a wail. A massive head, accompanied by a trail of gushing blood, flies spinning into the air. Your leader is already dead, give up the futile struggle, kneel before me, the resplendent dragon. Chris grabbed the head of the emperor whale leader, lifted it high above his head, making it clear to all the emperor whales present. The emperor whale leader died, and the emperor whales knelt down one after another, their weapons thrown aside carelessly. Chris did not let the jackal wolf people kill them all. He just confiscated the goblins' weapons. He surrounded them all. Now my subordinates are in need of military strength. Even if the goblins were enemies before, they must now contribute to absorbing this new blood. After all, the goblin leader who insulted our red dragon majesty is already dead. He's already dead. After the ground battle ended, the red dragon descended onto the earth on all fours, pressing down on a giant infant with its claws. This giant infant turned out to be the leader of the forest giants. It was still quite easy for Damar to recognize the leader among the monsters. The physique of a leader is usually larger and clearly different from other monsters. Thank you, great red dragon majesty. It is your presence that has given the Bonebreaker tribe the courage to be invincible. Therefore, they have defeated this rabble that dared to desecrate the dignity of the great dragon. Chris quickly jumped down from the prison, carrying the iron axe, and ran to me. He knelt on both knees, holding the emperor whale leader's head high in his hands. Daring to insult and blaspheme the great dragon, even if I originally wanted to spare your life. You must die. Well done, Chris. I have been watching the warriors of the Bone Crusher tribe. You did not disappoint me. I am satisfied watching Chris. This wild dog's strength is quite impressive, at least during the battle with the Imperial tribe. The jackal people have the upper hand, just as Chris said. If it weren't for the help of the forest giant baby from the Imperial tribe, they might have been defeated long ago. It definitely would not have taken this long. And now, the territory of the Dukafar Mountains has been completely taken over by me. Now, the Dukafar Mountains. Only some scattered monsters remain. I also ordered Chris to gather and enslave the remaining monsters. After instructing Chris, I turned my attention to my own claws. On the forest giant eagle leader, a humble, unkempt bird. Listen to my faithful wild dog, Chris. You are defying the will of the dragon. At this moment, Damel has completely lost the previous arrogance. Many feathers have fallen off his body, exposing patches of bald skin. A Damel nearly 8 meters tall. In front of me, he is like an ant, trembling. Great dragon, I have no intention of defying you. Everything that happened before was an accident. Damar replied in fear. If I had known beforehand, Chris is truly a follower of the dragon. She wouldn't have cooperated with the Dijin tribe, she had already joined the dragon. After all, she's not a fool. I don't think it was an accident. With a loud bang, sand and stones flew up for a moment. A sharp claw shot out from my finger, and it landed in front of Damar. Looking at the soul blade, which could take her life at any moment, Damar trembled all over. It's as if her soul is dispersing. Seeing that I had put enough pressure on Damar, I released my claw. I didn't want to kill Damar, who could become the leader of the forest giants. The leader of the giants, which means Damar has enough qualifications in wisdom. If I killed her, it would be a bit troublesome to find another leader of the forest giants. It's better to give her a chance. I stayed on the ground, overlooking Damar from a high vantage point. I need a pair of eyes that can help me monitor the Dokafa Mountains. Do you understand what I mean? The young eagle Damar's mind worked quickly. After listening to my words, he immediately made a vow to follow me. I understand everything, your majesty the great red dragon, I, Damar, am willing to offer you my most loyal soul. Every move considered by the Dorkafa Mountains, cannot escape your wise eyes. 
Actually, there's no need for me to imply, she had already prepared to surrender herself. To become a lackey of the great dragon, what a great honor. It's something that other ordinary monsters could never attain. Very well, for Damar's surrender, I am still very satisfied and nodded. After that, I turned my head and ordered Chris to clean up the battlefield. Then I spread my wings and left this land directly. I should also return to the lair to check on Sylvia's situation. I still value my first offspring very much, and secondly, I am also very concerned about Sylvia's safety. After all, now near the lair are all unruly monsters. Solely relying on Sylvia, a pregnant woman, is not enough to deter, and if not careful, she might even become a delicacy in the monster's mouths. When I returned to the dragon's lair, Sylvia came running excitedly. When I found out that those monsters had an exceptional respect for her, I also felt relieved. Afterward, I had a sweet moment with Sylvia. I then began to consider the future development of my clan. After a month, I managed to take over the Dorkafa Mountains, according to the map provided by Sylvia. I learned that the area where I am located is collectively known as the Galil Territory. Within the Galil Territory, there are four human kingdoms, as well as a territory ruled by a one-eyed giant. Giants are the mortal enemies of dragons, and the one-eyed giant with the bloodline of the giant titans is not weaker than dragons in terms of basic strength. However, when facing the older generation of powerful dragons, the one-eyed giant still has to retreat. So the one-eyed giant can only bully the dragons that are not yet adults. Your Majesty, are you considering future plans? Sylvia, seeing me looking at the map again, gathered the courage to ask. As the companion of a dragon, she doesn't just want to be a decoration. If possible, Sylvia would rather contribute to Her Majesty. We'll talk about the future later. What I need to do now is wait for the birth of the child. I just wanted to take a look at the power in this area. As for other matters, I don't want to consider them for the time being. After all, I am still 10 years away from adulthood, and I can't wait for revenge for that long. I am more interested in knowing how much benefit the birth of a child can bring me, rather than the natural growth of my own strength. Sylvia subconsciously touched her belly, her face turning slightly red with embarrassment, then seemed to remember something and gently lifted her red lips, saying, Your Majesty. If you really like children, you can go find more partners. The most important thing is, she alone can't possibly face me. It's necessary to find a sister to share some of the dragon's power. Sylvia has a deep understanding of this in the past few days. Find more partners. I raised an eyebrow, didn't expect Sylvia to think this way. But there's no need for Sylvia to say more, I will do it. The trouble now is that there are too many of them here. There are all sorts of weirdos in the Kaffa Mountains, and I don't like any of them. Not only that, the talent of the offspring can be possessed by oneself. This means that the partners I will look for in the future must absolutely not have poor talent themselves. Only in this way can it be greatly ensured that before the talent of the offspring refreshes, they can have very strong talent. For example, Sylvia now has her own talent for magic. In combination with one's own talent, the talent of the conceived child will be stronger. That's right, your majesty, please rest assured. I don't mind, you are a great dragon. Even human kings have many concubines. As a noble red dragon, what does it matter if you find more partners? At this point, I saw Sylvia's eyes welling up with tears. She is truly a princess from the royal family, always using royal rhetoric. Just as I was about to summon the cave stasis spell again, ready to reward Sylvia properly, Chris brought Damar into the dragon's lair. Great Majesty, the two monster leaders spoke in unison. Later, Chris also began to report to me about this battle achievement. Now, the Emperor Spirits have all been arranged by Chris into the Bone Fragment tribe. Once a leader-level Emperor Spirit is born among them, the Jackal people will set them free. Because without the leader Emperor Spirits, there is naturally no right to an independent tribe. All of them are attached to the Bone Fragment tribe, becoming servants enslaved by the Jackal people. Only when a leader-level Emperor Spirit is born again within the local spirits. Do they qualify to help the Emperor Spirits break free from the enslavement of the Jackal people and establish the Goblin tribe again? This is the rule among the monsters, and I am aware of it. After this incident, I like Chris even more. Although I really want to reward Chris with something. But at the moment, I really don't have a way to do it, because only adult dragons have the ability to bestow kinship blood. I am still 10 years away from becoming an adult dragon, so I can only embed Chris's kinship blood for now. After that, I send Chris and Damar away. They left the cave. And then I asked Sylvia to help settle the gold and silver treasures collected this time. I quickly walked towards the deepest part of the cave, and at that moment, I felt a wave of sleepiness, because the closer the dragon gets to adulthood, the sleepier it becomes. 
The next day, as soon as I opened my eyes, I saw Chris, excitedly rushing towards me. Great Red Dragon Majesty, didn't you want to find more companions? Yesterday, when I led the Bone Crusher tribe on a hunt, I encountered a group of Dark Elves. I believe that with your majesty's insight, you will surely like them very much. Chris knelt down excitedly, describing the events of yesterday. Dark Elves are a branch of the Elven race, or it could be said that they are a race abandoned by the Elves. The Elves' faith is in the Goddess of Nature. However, some Elves have betrayed their faith in the Goddess of Nature, becoming faithless Elves. Thus, the Dark Elves were born. Most Elves are female, living in a matriarchal society. The faction of the Dark Elves is chaotic and kind. Dark Elves, I quickly searched through the dragon's heritage and found information about the appearance of the Dark Elves. My eyes lit up immediately. They do look good, although the skin of the Dark Elves is dark purple. But their figure and appearance are impeccable. After all, they are elves, so naturally they are not ugly. Yes, Great Majesty, if you like the Dark Elves, I can lead the Shattered Grain Tribe to capture them. Seeing my expression, Chris couldn't help but volunteer, confirming my expectations. This is His Majesty's aesthetic. Although the mothers he seeks may appear unattractive to these creatures, but as long as his majesty likes her, they will go to great lengths to capture her. I tried hard to restrain the smile at the corner of my mouth and issued the order with great seriousness. Then capture them. Don't disappoint me, Chris. I grant you the authority to command the Falcon tribe. Upon receiving my command, Chris quickly assembled the Jackal tribe and some of the forest giants, marching mightily towards the residence of the Dark Elves. Meanwhile, I closed my eyes again to rest, waiting for Chris to bring back the Dark Elves, preparing for a fierce battle with the Dark Elves tonight. However, just as I was dozing off, a forest giant rushed into my lair in a panic. Respected Red Dragon Majesty, Chief Chris and the Dark Elf Queen have been attacked by an unknown creature. Both sides have suffered heavy casualties. Please come to provide support. What kind of creature dares to hunt and kill my dragon's clan? After receiving the information, my drowsiness was completely replaced by anger. I no longer waited, swiftly spread my dragon wings, and rushed out of the cave at an extremely fast speed, daring to harm my tribe and my future mate. Even if you are a one-eyed giant, I will tear you apart. However, at the deepest part of the forest, Chris's Bonebreaker tribe and the Dark Elf Bipedals are currently engaged in a fierce battle with a huge underground creature. The jackals of Chris's Bonebreaker tribe are acting as a shield in the front. Attracting the attention of the enormous creature, Queen Inowen of the Dark Elves, is leading the elven warriors, providing continuous long-range support from the rear with bows and arrows. However, the next moment, sand and stones flew, dust rose, and the enormous creature burst out of the ground. It bit down, and the jackal people around her instantly turned into blood plasma. Then her massive body was completely exposed to everyone. In front, her body resembled a great white shark, covered in a gray-blue shell, and had sturdy limbs. This, this is the shark lizard beast. Seeing the appearance of the monster clearly, Chris was stunned and speechless. She had only heard about the horror of this creature in rumors, and now seeing it, it was truly terrifying. But even with this kind of size, it was still able to keep up with her loyal red dragon majesty. Stop daydreaming, launch an attack on her. Otherwise, when she burrows back into the ground, we won't have any way to deal with her. Inowen saw Chris daydreaming. She quickly reminded him. All right, we get it. Red Dragon Clan Warriors. Let this beast see what it means to be loyal to the giant Dragon Clan Warriors. Chris impatiently said a sentence, then Inowen immediately mounted her horse and rode towards the Sand Beast. Originally, Chris was ordered to attack the Dark Elf Tribe. But who knew that her plan was intercepted by this Sand Lizard just as it began to unfold? Not only were the captured Dark Elf prisoners eaten, but her Bone Crusher Tribe also suffered heavy casualties. In order to survive, the Bone Crusher tribe and the Dark Elves ultimately chose to join forces. Only in this way do they have a glimmer of hope for survival in the face of this sand lizard. Kill me, and my spirit will live on forever. For the tribe, at this moment, everyone put aside their grievances and became partners fighting side by side. Everyone surrounded the gigantic sand lizard. It was surrounded in the center by everyone. Seeing this group of prey daring to approach, the sand lizard immediately opened its blood-filled mouth and roared. A deafening roar shook the air, as it pierced through the bodies of everyone, even feeling their insides trembling. A dark elf leapt high in the lead, intending to split the lizard's head with a single blow, but the sand lizard just raised its head and opened its mouth wide, and in one gulp, swallowed the dark elf whole. Whose idea was this? Chris has never seen such foolishness, can't even win in a group fight, and just handed over a life. 
After another ten minutes of fierce battle, the sand lizard remained extremely ferocious, showing no signs of fatigue. However, both the Bone Crusher tribe and the Dark Elf tribe suffered heavy casualties. Just as the sand lizard prepared for another attack, despair filled Chris's face, Your Majesty, if there's another life, I, Chris, will continue to be your faithful dog. Chris let out a furious roar to the sky, then prepared to lead the remaining troops for one final charge. However, at that moment, a knoll suddenly grabbed Chris's shoulder and pointed towards the distant horizon. Leader, look over there. What is it? Chris said with some irritation. Then he raised his head and followed the gaze of his wolf cub. The previously clear half of the sky gradually turned into a blazing red sunset. A massive figure is rapidly flying towards us. It's not just anyone, it's the dragon they are sworn to, the red dragon. As my figure arrives, a domineering dragon roar sweeps through the entire scene. It leaves the night elves, who are preparing for a desperate fight, completely stunned, including the killer beast. The arrival of the dragon, with its terrifying presence, overwhelms everything. Accompanied by a wave of scorching flames, the sand lizard hasn't had time to react yet. It's instantly hit by a scorching flame and sent flying backwards. The sand lizard, which everyone has struggled to break through, is knocked back by a simple flame from the red dragon. You should know, this isn't my breath of fire, it's just the red dragon's innate low-level fire magic, it's like a person spitting. Queen Inowen, that is the red dragon night elves, the spirits see the red dragon about to land in the sky. Each one is so scared, they gather around their own Queen Inowen, completely devoid of the courage they had when facing the sand lizard before. The sand lizard might still be able to be defeated, but with a red dragon, how could they be opponents? With a loud roar, my forefeet stepped on the ground. In the moment of descent, the flapping of the dragon wings raised the dust. The majestic power of the dragon spread from my body, quickly swept across the entire battlefield. The sand lizard shook its head and body, standing up again. Feeling once again the heavy pressure of the dragon power from my body. As a beast, she felt a hint of fear and panic. Just like a threatened beast, issuing a low growl at me, trying to scare me away. Driving away ignorant beasts, even the great true dragon can't recognize me, speaking mildly and peacefully. I'm not like those monsters, like Chris, who don't recognize the sand lizard at all. At the first sight of the sand lizard, I found the information about the sand lizard from the true dragon heritage. In summary, it's a creature with low intelligence, encountering those weaker than her. She hits others on the head. When she meets someone stronger, she gets hit on the head, whether she hits or not, she always has to go up and touch. The sand lizard crouched low, not daring to move for a moment. The looming dragon power around, occasionally reminding of the danger to life. Celebrate the arrival of the great red dragon majesty. Ignorant and lowly beast, you have no right to bark at a true dragon. Chris is now standing up, showing the relationship between herself and me. Upon hearing this, Enowen's heart sank. No wonder this red dragon appeared here, turns out it's with the gnolls. After dealing with the lizard beast, the next target is their tribe. Enowen thought of this, and clenched the double-edged blade in her hand. Alright Chris, stop being a lapdog here. Go keep an eye on them. If the elves run away, you should know what will happen. I glanced at the petite Chris beside me and reminded her. The main goal of this trip is not to kill the rhino beast, but that group of dark elves. Please rest assured, with my great majesty and the bonebreaker tribe here, the elves cannot escape. Behind the elven clan is a cliff. Chris had long ordered the gnolls to block any escape routes. The dark elves want to escape, unless they grow wings and fly off the cliff. I nodded in satisfaction, my loyal little dog still has some brains. However, at this moment, the sand lizard beast could no longer endure the pressure emanating from me. The pressure that can oppress the soul. A large amount of sand splashed as it faced me, and it chose to burrow and escape directly. It seems the sand lizard has a low IQ, but when facing an unbeatable enemy, it still chose the smarter option of running away. But could I let the sand lizard go? I immediately stepped forward with my huge body. With strong front limbs, I grabbed the sand lizard, which hadn't completely burrowed underground. With a strong tug, half of the body of the sand lizard that had burrowed underground was pulled out, as if it was forcefully pulled out like a radish. I am different from other red dragons, with especially strong hind legs. I can briefly stand on my hind legs. I lifted the sand lizard high above my head and smashed it towards the nearby woods. The massive body of the sand lizard, like a cannonball, broke the tall trees in half. My scorching and fiery starry eyes, through the thick sand, watched the movements of the sand lizard lying on the ground. Lowly creature, stand up. I know you're not dead yet. Not dead yet, as I approached the sand lizard, I also used my dragon wings on my back to stir up the dust floating in the air. The full picture of the sand lizard was revealed after the recent attack. 
The sand lizard's body finally showed some damage. Crimson blood flowed from its mouth, indicating internal damage from the impact. The sand lizard's head is now dizzy. In a daze, I saw a figure completely covered in dark red, approached its own front. She wanted to lift her proud claws to fight back, but she couldn't muster the strength. Seeing the sand lizard enter a semi-conscious state, I simply grabbed its body, forcefully pried open her mouth. A strong smell of sulfur emanated from my mouth, emitting a dazzling red light from my throat. Quickly gathering in my mouth, I was about to use the red dragon's fiery breath directly at the sand lizard's mouth. The pungent smell of sulfur filled my nostrils, causing the sand lizard beneath me to emit a fearful cry after smelling it. Although I didn't know what to do next, the sand lizard sensed the impending death. No matter how the sand lizard struggled, it couldn't break free from my grip. Claws that could dig into the soil kept flapping against my dragon scales, leaving only white marks, unable to truly damage the dragon. As the flames in my mouth gathered momentum, I didn't hesitate at all. Accompanied by a dragon roar, a column of fire erupted from my mouth. A rush of impact went into the mouth of the sand lizard. The scorching heat even distorted the surrounding space at one point. The sand lizard's belly gradually lit up with the breath of fire, and even through the thick shell, the light inside the sand lizard's belly could be faintly seen. The sand lizard's terrifying, earth-shattering roar made the monsters instinctively retreat. It was truly terrifying, they couldn't believe it, when faced with this breath of fire. What kind of scene would it be? Some young dark elves even buried their heads in their parents' arms. They dared not look at this scene. Is this the dragon? Inowen had never truly seen a dragon. She had only ever heard the legends of dragons through her ears. Seeing a dragon today, she truly understood one thing. The dragon was even more terrifying and powerful than the rumors, truly living up to being hailed as one of the most powerful creatures on the continent. Most importantly, the dragon didn't need to train at all. Relying on their strong and powerful physique, they just needed to grow slowly. Strength could surpass them, the dark elves, the elves who had worked hard all their lives. The movements of the sand lizard gradually slowed down, and eventually it disappeared completely. A hint of meaty aroma emanated from its body, then it was roasted by the flame earth elementals. After catching a whiff of the meaty scent, I licked my lips and, in front of everyone, began to gnaw on the body of the sand lizard. Whether it's a monster from my clan, or the dark elves of the dark moon tribe, everyone stood still, quietly watching as the dragon feasted. After being satiated, my aggressive eyes turned towards the dark elves. The dark elves are quite impressive, even more beautiful than Sylvanas. Feeling the dragon's gaze and pressure, as the queen, Inowen still shielded her people behind her. Great dragon, we, the elves of the Dark Moon tribe, have no conflict with you. If you desire our territory, we will yield it to you. Please forgive our previous actions. We didn't know that this group of gnolls were your clan's kin. Not knowing that Chris was a dragon kin, Inowen also spoke word by word. After learning Chris's identity, she promptly turned into the gnoll's name. One has to admit, this world is very realistic, might makes right. Your actions are of no interest to me, because you are my target. Or perhaps my goal is you, the queen of the dark elves. I slowly walked up to the dark elf. My crimson eyes continued to press down on her. I have to admit, elves are very beautiful, even the dark elves with altered skin tone. They all fit my aesthetic, but not just any Tom, Dick, or Harry is worthy of me. Finally, my gaze rested on Inwen. At first glance, this female dark elf is the leader of this elven tribe, the target is us, and the hearts of the dark elves present here grew even colder. It's said that dragons love to eat elves and humans. Today, they finally understood this truth. And when clenched her teeth, gripped two curved knives, ready for life or death. Then let's fight it out with them. Seeing in Wen's actions, the monsters all drew their weapons, and both sides entered a standoff. I can't be bothered to explain myself to the dark elves. Let them listen to the dragon's explanation. They are not worthy at all. So I gave Chris a look, and at this moment, the role of Chris, this wild dog, was revealed. Receiving a look from our own majesty, Chris understood and immediately stepped forward. The thoughts of a true dragon are not something you lowly elves can guess. Let this most loyal hound by his majesty's side speak to you for a moment. His great majesty does not want to eat you, but to have you, the night elves, join the dragons and serve the true dragons as soldiers. At first, when they heard that the dragons do not eat their own kind, the night elves breathed a sigh of relief. But when they heard that they were to join the ranks of the dragons, everyone became extremely nervous once again. Although the night elves have been abandoned by the goddess of nature, they have always been peaceful and friendly creatures. To have them join the chaotic and evil group of monsters, isn't this contrary to their independent thoughts and desires? But if they refuse, the outcome is self-evident, they will definitely be torn apart alive by the enraged dragons, or even eaten. 
In the end, the night elves hesitated repeatedly, unwilling to give up their own beliefs, directing their attention and pressure. All focused on Queen Tyrant. Everything is left to Tyrant to decide, because she is the queen of the night elves. If Tyrant chooses to defend honor, then they will fight, even if it means dying for freedom. If Tyrant chooses to join the dragons to survive, they can console themselves that this was Queen Tyrant's decision, that it was Tyrant who betrayed the will of the night elves. To become a queen, one must not only have great strength, but also a certain level of intelligence. Inan is able to understand the meaning in the eyes of these tribal people. Suddenly, the pressure is immense. On one hand, it's the indomitable freedom of the night elves, on the other, it's the safety of the tribe. After careful consideration, Inan half kneels on the ground. I am willing to join the great true dragon clan and become your follower. She is the queen of the Dark Moon tribe, not just an ordinary warrior. She must consider the entire tribe, even if it means bearing infamy, so that the tribe's people can survive. Even if she loses her dignity, Inan kneels on one knee. Leaving the other night elves looking at each other, the good news is they survived, the bad news is their dignity and freedom are lost. But upon careful thought, at least our lives are spared, your majesty, the red dragon. The night elves all kneel down. They pay the highest respect to the red dragon before them. The dark moon tribe, from this point on, joins the dragon clan, becoming my vassals. Inan, do you have a partner now? My crimson eyes fall on Inan once again, with a slight upward curve at the corner of my mouth. Reporting to his majesty, Han Long, I currently do not have a partner, although Inan is unaware. Why did I suddenly ask such a question, but I quickly made a response. I nodded in satisfaction, said no more, and then directly spread my dragon wings and left the place. Congratulations on joining our dragon clan. From now on, we are comrades fighting side by side. Pack up your things and follow us to the Dukafa Mountains. That is the territory of our dragon clan. Chris watched my departing figure, gradually withdrew his gaze, and turned to look at the surviving night elves, announcing loudly the declaration of the Enovan clan joining the dragon clan. Chief Chris, just now, His Majesty the Red Dragon asked me what a partner means. Enovan was somewhat puzzled. She was originally waiting for me to speak, but I left directly, which left her even more confused. You don't have to worry. That's the great red dragon majesty taking a liking to you. Do you want to become the partner of his majesty the red dragon? Chris hurriedly shook his head to explain. She doesn't look down on the night elves at all. They're so ugly, not even one-tenth as good looking as the female gnolls among them. I've recommended beautiful female gnolls to his majesty the red dragon several times, but each time he drove them out of the lair. I really don't know why. His Majesty the Red Dragon just likes this kind of partner. To put it bluntly, even if Enovan were to offer herself to him, Chris doesn't want to become the partner of His Majesty the Red Dragon. Enovan was stunned when she heard this. The magnificent and robust figure of the Red Dragon once again appeared in her mind. Her strong body and domineering momentum really make her a little excited. But how could a dragon be interested in her? It's almost like a night elf wanting to eat her. It must be the jackal people in front of us amusing themselves. Chris, stop kidding around. This is not funny at all. In Wen's criteria for finding a partner is simple, having a healthy and strong physique. Stronger than her. Unfortunately, there is not a single night elf in the Dark Moon tribe who can beat her. The conditions of the Red Dragon Majesty are indeed all suitable. But she is self-aware, as proud as a dragon. How could they be interested in such a humble creature? This is not a joke, it's serious. In Wen, if you are willing to become the companion of the Red Dragon Majesty, when we go back, I can tell the Red Dragon Majesty immediately. Seeing Chris's expression, it seems he is not joking. In Wen's eyes gradually become serious. At the same time, she is a bit conflicted. Becoming a dragon's companion, can this size difference really work? But in order to find a dragon as a companion, for any creature, it's as difficult as reaching the sky. Thinking about it, In Wen still grits her teeth. She nods and agrees. One day later, near the dragon's nest in the Deroder Mountains, the Dark Elves are beginning to construct buildings near the dragon's lair. Chris, with Enowen in tow, is hurrying towards the lair where I am. Great Red Dragon Majesty, your faithful hound, Chris, can finally see you again. That majestic figure gives me the utmost honor. The moment Chris knelt down, he started patting the dragon's backside. It feels like meeting me is like becoming a god, knowing full well that Chris is patting the dragon's backside. I'm quite pleased, it feels very comfortable. Even Enowen couldn't help but look at Chris a little longer. When I first met Chris, I had no idea he was this kind of rogue. But she quickly snapped out of it. Great Red Dragon Majesty, Enowen, leader of the Dark Moon tribe. 
I offer you my utmost respect, and dedicate my soul to you, as I did when the Dark Moon tribe was loyal to me. Enowen forgot to offer her loyalty. Now that she sees me again, she immediately makes up for it, expressing her loyalty. While sneaking a glance at me, Enowen also noticed something surprising. There is a heavily pregnant human woman beside me. Why is there a woman next to the dragon? Enowen took just one glance and then quickly lowered her head, her eyes filled with shock. What she didn't know was, Sylvia was playfully patting her belly. Enwen, have your Twilight tribe been living in that forest for a long time? I nodded slightly, embracing Sylvia tightly and replied with a smile, yes. Your Majesty, the Twilight tribe has been living in that forest for over 200 years. I am the fourth generation leader. In my presence, Enwen won't refer to herself as a queen, just call me the leader. I remember you as the fourth generation. Aren't the night elves' lifespans quite long? The normal lifespan of elves reaches 700 years, but the night elves have forsaken their faith. Cursed by the goddess of nature, their lifespan is only 200 years, but compared to other races, they still have some advantages. For example, humans have a lifespan of only 100 years. A 200-year lifespan should not be taken for granted. It's only fitting for a leader. That's right, your majesty, the previous three leaders, all sacrificed themselves in defending the Twilight tribe in battle. Inwin felt a bit ashamed as she said this, all the previous queens died on the battlefield. Only she has compromised and become the Red Dragon's puppet, but she really had no choice. If she didn't do this, the Twilight tribe would completely perish, and there would be no future. So that's it. I thought it was the elves in the Dark Moon tribe who had some disagreements among themselves. Inowen's lips parted slightly, as if she wanted to speak, but didn't know what to say. In fact, she really wanted to mention what Chris had told her yesterday, but she didn't have the courage to say it out loud. I'm just afraid that it might turn out to be false, and it will become a joke. However, at this critical moment, Chris, who had been wanting to interrupt all along, suddenly shouted loudly, Great Emperor Hongnong, I have already taken care of what you wanted. Inowen is willing to be your companion. It was still Chris who took the initiative to bring this up. This was the task given by the Emperor, and she had to do it well. Yes, your majesty, if you don't mind that I am an elf, I am willing to be your companion. Hearing Chris say that, Inowen knew that Chris wasn't joking yesterday. She quickly added, and at the same time, the nervousness and panic in her heart were completely dispelled. It all made sense. Chris wasn't lying to her. The dragon really took a liking to her. Is that so? My tail hidden behind me gently wagged. Chris, who had been watching, suddenly exclaimed, Hey, your majesty, the red dragon. I remembered that there were still some things not handled properly, so I took a step back for now, just as I finished speaking. Chris hurriedly ran out, leaving the space to his majesty and Inowen. Seeing Chris leave, Sylvia, who hadn't said a word, finally spoke. Hello, nice to meet you. I'm Sylvia. I am his majesty's companion. Sylvia took the initiative to greet Inowen, extending her fair right hand. You're so tall. Sylvia took the initiative to start a conversation. Not really, we dark elves aren't that tall. Almost. Inowen awkwardly touched her head. The usual heroic and bold character of the dark elves disappeared without a trace. I can't believe it. The human Sylvia in front of me is actually the companion of the red dragon majesty. Then, does her big belly carry the majesty's child? From now on, we are good sisters. Sylvia's beautiful eyes curved into crescents, smiling. Finally, I have a companion. After Sylvia and Inowen opened up, they quickly became a clique. Looking at my harem, not noisy, not fighting, I'm also very happy. Your Majesty, I really like this Inowen sister, Sylvia smiled. I turned around and cast a knowing glance at anyone. Then he turned back to look at me and smiled as he walked out of the dragon's lair. Then I won't disturb sister anyone and your Majesty. Sylvia is very sensible, just like Chris. He left all the space in the dragon's lair to anyone and me. In an instant, a blush appeared on Inowen's pale purple cheeks. She became extremely shy. Anyone, come over here. I cast a sound and image isolation spell, cutting off the sounds and sights inside the dragon's lair. Soon, it was nighttime. Anyone held her stomach. She walked out of the dragon's lair unsteadily. Queen Anyone, no, no, Mother Anyone, all the tents have been set up. Several Dark Elves soldiers hurried forward to report as soon as they saw Anyone come out. Hearing the change in the tribe's address, Anyone knew that the tribe knew about her becoming my partner. She breathed a sigh of relief. Looking at everyone's expressions, they seemed to have accepted it, saving her from having to explain further. However, Ainiwen didn't know that, along with her becoming the Red Dragon's partner and the attention of the monsters. The status of the Dark Elf tribe had also skyrocketed in an instant. 
The elves have always been sneering, and the gnolls have also changed their demeanor in an instant. This also means that the Dark Moon tribe has firmly established its position in the Dragonkin clan, and they no longer have to live in fear for their survival. Just call me queen, main mother sounds a bit strange, to say the least. The elves of the Dark Moon tribe have been calling her queen for a full five years, suddenly changing to main mother. This made anyone feel a bit strange. Time flies like a white horse passing a crevice, and half a year has passed in the blink of an eye. The day when Sylvanas gives birth is also getting closer and closer. During this half year, a goblin leader finally emerged from within the goblins. Chris also did not hesitate to kick the goblin clan out of the Bonebreaker tribe. So, my clan has also been divided into four major parts. They are the Forest Giant Eagle Hunting Falcon Tribe, the Null Bonebreaker Tribe, the Dark Elves Dark Moon Tribe, and the Mighty Emperor Wales Worn Tribe. The rest of the monsters have started to take on the role of servants, occasionally helping the monsters of the four tribes. And incidentally, under the guidance of the Dark Elves, the goblins have learned to domesticate livestock and manage mounts. The resources of the multi Kafar Mountains are now completely under the control of my tribe. The surrounding areas are all hunting grounds for monsters. Sometimes, when we want a change of pace, we go to the multi Kafar Mountains to hunt. There's also some good news in the past six months, Inuin is pregnant. This will be a descendant with both dragon and elf bloodlines, with S level Dark Moon amplification talent, S level Red Dragon physique talent, and an extremely powerful leadership talent. Inuin's child has greatly exceeded my expectations turning out to have dual S-level talents. I have once again saved my energy, not having to exhaust myself to refresh talents. According to the true dragon inheritance records, they are descendants of dragons and elves. It will probably take about two years to carry, which is twice as long as a human. But for me, it's nothing. It's just a mere two years, like a nap for an ancient dragon. Your Majesty, Mother Sylvia is about to give birth. Those with experience in childbirth, please help me pay attention. If Sylvia's sister's delivery is delayed, heads will roll. Even a new one has stepped forward. Waving our own Dark Moon tribe, your majesty, please rest assured, we have the presence of the Dark Elves. We can definitely protect Sylvia's sister and ensure the safety of mother and child. Inuin's belly is not very noticeable at the moment, just slightly bulging, like having had a full meal. I nodded slightly, although I appeared calm on the surface, my heart was in a state of panic. After all, this is her first time being a father the first time having her own child, especially when her partner is a human. I am even more worried about Sylvia's safety, but as the king of the Red Dragon Clan, I will not show my inner thoughts on my face. In the eyes of outsiders, I am still the fierce and solemn dragon. The time of delivery passed by every minute and second, and finally, after a few hours, the birth happened. A sound that excited everyone echoed throughout the entire Red Dragon territory, while I was still in a daze. As my most loyal subordinate, Kesley quickly stood up, excited as if the child were hers. After the other creatures reacted, they all started expressing their emotions, but what these creatures said was just too chaotic. It's not even a fraction of what Chris has, and only Chris can comfort the dragon. A female dark elf walked out holding a baby, and the baby in her arms was my child. The baby was wrapped in a warm blanket, only showing the cute little head. She was my firstborn daughter. I nodded in satisfaction, suppressing my inner excitement, and immediately gave the child a name, Gwendolyn Sylvia. The first part is the name, and the second part is her mother's name, which will also make it easier for me to distinguish in the future. Who is the mother of my child? First detected the birth of the host's eldest daughter, testing bloodlines, the bloodline of humans and red dragons. Congratulations on receiving the reward. The indomitable crown is shared with the children. Talent S plus magic affinity superimposed to strengthen the physique. The indomitable crown, any creature, including the pressure of the gods, cannot have any effect on you, immune to illusions, growing into an indomitable spirit in the later stage, an immortal soul. After reading the properties of the indomitable crown, a glint of gold flashed in my eyes. I didn't expect the system to reward me with a growth-type equipment. Don't be fooled, the indomitable crown can only resist pressure for now. But later on, as long as the spirit is indomitable, the soul is immortal, it's like a life-saving artifact at the bug level. The condition for upgrading the indomitable crown is to withstand multiple high-level pressures, then gain experience, and upgrade. But then again, I am a red dragon. Probably, apart from older dragons, there are basically no creatures that can exert pressure on me. Shaking my head, I don't want to think about these things for now. After all, everything will fall into place in the end. As I move my thoughts, the indomitable crown appeared on my head. The equipment is invisible, no creature can see it, it is directly bound to my soul. 
After claiming all the rewards, I had someone take me to the delivery room and Sylvia with the child. Sylvia hugged Gwendolyn and pressed her face against Gwendolyn's body. Gwendolyn extended her little hand, touching her mother's hair. Not far away. Enid, who came in, saw this heartwarming scene. She subconsciously touched her stomach, wondering when her child would be born. I looked at the extremely weak Sylvia at this moment. I felt it was time to tell her something, Sylvia. The hostile kingdom that invaded your Avi kingdom initially has long been in cahoots with the Fiat kingdom. This is also why the Fiat kingdom did not help your ally kingdom to resist the invasion. I told Sylvia the intelligence I had gathered. Since Sylvia became my partner, I immediately arranged for Chris and the others to gather information about the human kingdom. Chris is very clever, he caught a few spies. When they heard they could join the true dragon clan, the spies were so excited, they were in tears. They promised to become qualified dogs, and so, the spies transformed into human form and secretly infiltrated the Eli kingdom. Oh, now it should be the lead kingdom, the spies disguised themselves as beggars and hid in remote corners. I've heard some news. Actually, I had already guessed some of this before meeting his majesty's spirit. Sylvia sighed softly. The downfall of the kingdom of Orai was not unjust, as they didn't even know their allies had betrayed them. The only thing Sylvia hates is that after conquering the kingdom of Orai, the kingdom of Red also slaughtered the royal bloodline. This is a grudge she must settle. They also slaughtered all the royal bloodline. This is a grudge she must settle. Don't worry, Sylvia. Soon, I will make the so-called kingdom of Red pay the price. At this moment, my eyes are sharp, and the killing intent within me fills the entire room. Red dragons are creatures that are destined to explode from their teeth. Sylvia has become my partner, so her grudge is naturally mine. Furthermore, no matter how things develop for me in the future, I can't avoid the kingdom of red and the kingdom of fight. These two human kingdoms are unavoidable. It's time to let these two kingdoms know how fierce the dragons can be. I then no longer disturbed Sylvia and Gwyn, letting Dorin rest. I instructed Inuin to take good care of this mother and daughter. Then I strode out of the delivery room, beginning to consider how to create the first conflict with the human kingdom. Time passed quickly, and a few months went by. Little Doran inherited her mother's magical talent, gradually manifesting it. After discussing with my two partners, finally decided that Sylvia will be the one to teach little Dolly magic control. But being a magician also has its pros and cons, the advantage being high-intensity magic bombardment. The downside is that after the magic is exhausted, a magician is like a fish waiting to be slaughtered. After much consideration, I decided to let anyone teach little Dolly some sword skills, in case of unexpected disorder. After all, I am just a dragon and have no idea how to take care of a child, so I'll leave it to my two companions. Although over the past few months, watching my offspring live happily, there have always been some flies buzzing around in front of my eyes. That is, humans keep intruding into the Dukura Mountains to transport goods. In the past six months, the Dukura Mountains have already declared to the outside world that it is the territory of monsters. No other sentient beings are allowed to step foot. I have not revealed my dragon identity, after all, I am still an immature dragon. If others were to find out about my existence, humans would definitely launch a frenzied attack on me. Anything on a dragon is invaluable. People outside only know that this is the territory of a powerful monster. Away from them, there is a human town in the Dukura Mountains, under the rule of the Red Kingdom. Ordinary human towns wouldn't intentionally disturb the monster's territory. Because they are relatively close, why create enemies for ourselves? It's better for everyone to live in peace. But this human town, knowing it's the monster's territory, still repeatedly and frequently crosses the red line of my soldiers. I suspect there's an instruction from the Red Kingdom behind this, otherwise they wouldn't dare to do so. After that, I ordered Chris to lead the group to the border of the Dokafa Mountains for defense. If humans dare to cross the line again, just cut off whichever footsteps over first. The big battle is approaching just to be prepared for any eventuality. I also ordered Damar to go alone to the human city to scout their overall strength. If possible, then just take down this city. For the monsters, there are many resources that only humans possess, such as the magic wand, magic books, clothes, accessories needed by Sylvia. Things that monsters cannot provide for Sylvia. Not only that, the equipment of the monsters also needs to be upgraded. The equipment made by goblins is still acceptable, but compared to professional human blacksmiths, it's far inferior. There are probably very few who are more skilled than human blacksmiths in the entire continent. But when I got the scouting results, I was almost furious. They dared to provoke me even with tens of thousands of people in the town. They're really rushing to their death. The Red Kingdom didn't wait for me to find them. 
They came to harass me in advance. When I grow up, I will definitely be the first to launch an attack on the Red Kingdom. Next is that adolescent little red dragon. However, at this moment, Chris came running from outside the dragon dynasty. After making a distinctive rainbow fart, she quickly reported the border situation to me. The werewolves she led have already had a conflict with the human caravan. And what these caravans are transporting isn't supplies at all, but a pile of junky stones. However, according to Chris's questioning of the people transporting the stones, they also received orders to keep hovering near the border. Listening to the report, my face became more and more serious. It seems that these humans have long been prepared for the monsters to attack the caravan. This is clearly a lure, tempting us to make the first move. I sneered, my dark red pupils flickering, a plan rising in my mind. It looks like the dragon soldiers are ready to show their blades and fangs to the outside world. Your Majesty, are you planning to conquer the human city? If so, your loyal dog Chris is willing to take the vanguard. Hearing the anger in my words, Chris once again expressed her loyalty. Your Majesty, since they have chosen to cross the border, they must be prepared to face the wrath of the Red Dragon. Our D Jean plan can also be at the forefront, expanding the territory for Your Majesty. D Jean leader Bada steps forward. Kneel. The D Jean clan holds a place within our tribe by virtue of their numbers and strength. Your Majesty, the Dark Elves also have the strength to be at the forefront. On the side, a silent Inowen also steps forward without showing weakness, taking big strides. His face is filled with coldness. This is the first battle they have encountered since the Dark Elves joined the Dragon Clan. She must obtain it to demonstrate the perfect combat power of the Dark Elves. I nod slightly, my expression becoming increasingly gloomy, according to Damel's report. The strength of the human town is not very strong. I intend to let Chris lead your major tribes to attack. No matter what methods you use, the only result I want is to successfully capture that human town. At the same time, I also plan to secretly follow my monster troops, quietly watching everything from behind. In the future, I will definitely fight against the human kingdom. The monsters must accumulate experience in fighting humans, and learn how to successfully siege a city. This human town is a good opportunity for practice. It can't always be me, the Red Dragon Emperor, standing at the forefront, facing the enemy's bombardment. It's not just me, there isn't a single dragon in the world that does this. They all let the monsters charge first, then when the attack is almost complete or the monsters can't handle it, they will show up. Chris's face lit up. Great, the king has given me the important task of capturing the human town this time. The other monster leaders all looked at Chris, who couldn't help but burst into laughter. Each of them cursed Chris silently in their hearts. He's really good at kissing up to the dragon, he's just the king's favorite. Even this kind of thing is entrusted to Chris. But the monster leaders quickly changed their attitude. If they perform well this time, perhaps the king will hand over the command of the monsters to them next time. Thank you for your trust, your majesty. You truly are the brightest sun in the sky, with a discerning eye that can see through my abilities at a glance. I, Chris, will not let you down, your majesty. Chris stood up happily and knelt before me. He clenched his fist and placed it on his chest. I hope so, Chris. Don't disappoint me. After discussing the plan, the monster leaders left the dragon's lair one by one. After a while, Sylvia led Gwendolyn by the hand and walked in. They had arrived earlier, but Sylvia, being considerate, did not bring Gwendolyn in to disturb everyone. Instead, she waited until the discussion was over before entering. Daddy, I learned a lot of magic today. Gwendolyn broke free from her mother's hand and ran to her father, Westwood. She vividly described her afternoon's achievements. Westwood patiently listened to Gwendolyn's words, a smile unconsciously appearing on his face. Well done, Gwendolyn. When you have fully mastered one ring magic and become a junior mage, I will teach you dragon language magic. Westwood lightly brushed Gwendolyn's back with his tail. Dragon language magic? Gwendolyn was a bit puzzled by her father Westwood's words. Her mother had told her a lot about magic this afternoon, but had never mentioned dragon language magic. Your Majesty, are you going to teach little Gwendolyn dragon language magic? Sylvia asked in slight surprise. It had been mentioned before that besides elemental magic, there were some unique types of magic, and dragon language magic was one of them. Dragon language magic involved releasing unique elemental magic attacks based on the attributes of the dragons themselves. For example, Westwood was a red dragon, so he could release fire elemental dragon language magic. The power of dragon language magic was stronger than regular human magic, leading to the emergence of a profession among humans called dragon language mages. Through some neutral creatures who understood dragon language, known as semi-dragons, they provided benefits in exchange for teaching those individuals the obscure dragon language. Don't think there are many dragon language mages, 
In fact, learning dragon language is extremely difficult. Out of a million people, it's already quite rare for one person to learn dragon language. And this complex and obscure dragon language is a language that dragons are born with. Well, Gwendolyn has my red dragon bloodline, so even though she can't naturally speak dragon language, she should be able to learn it. Westwood said, Learning dragon language magic would make Gwendolyn a dragon language mage, enhancing her strength. After sharing Gwendolyn's magic affinity, Westwood's talent for magic skyrocketed. Generally, red dragons are not good at magic, their most powerful weapons are their breath and strong bodies. Among the five colored dragons, only green dragons excel in magic. Green dragons have the weakest physical strength among the five colored dragons, even weaker than a mentally deficient white dragon. Therefore, they are more proficient in magic. With their powerful dragon language magic, they have secured a position as the third strongest among the five colored dragons, surpassing black and white dragons in overall strength. Now, with the S magic affinity, Westwood can master more dragon language magic, enough to become Gwendolyn's teacher. That's great. Sylvia sincerely felt happy for her daughter. Initially, after becoming Westwood's companion, he had considered teaching her dragon language to see if she could become a dragon language mage. However, Sylvia's magical talent was indeed good, but her talent for learning dragon language was almost non-existent. No matter how Westwood tried to teach her, Sylvia couldn't learn it. Over time, Westwood gave up on the idea. Since she couldn't learn it, it was better not to waste time on it. Yay! I want to learn dragon language magic. At this moment, Gwendolyn was not aware of what dragon language magic entailed, she was just happy to see her mother. She thought it must be something amazing since even her mother hadn't learned it. If she learned it, wouldn't that mean she surpassed her mother? In the dragon's lair, the family was happily bonding and strengthening their relationship. Nearby, the monsters around the lair were already preparing for the upcoming war. Sharpen my weapons for me. Chris supervised the goblins polishing their weapons. Tomorrow would mark the first battle between the West Shepherd clan and humans, and as the commander, he had to be prepared. If he failed in this matter, his position in the king's heart would surely plummet, and some monster leader would take his place. Rest assured, leader Chris, with the weapons polished by us goblins, they will become the sharpest blades in the world, boasted goblin leader Walk. Enough, Walk, don't forget who I am. When it comes to boasting, who knows better than me? I don't need your flattery, just the facts, Chris impatiently waved his hand. He was known as the biggest flatterer in the entire clan, able to come up with all sorts of words. So, he was least patient with Walk's words. Relax, relax, Walk awkwardly smiled. He just wanted to see if he could cheer Chris up like he did with the Red Dragon Majesty. But it backfired. Walk, are the weapons you made for me ready? Anna one walked out at this moment. Although she was still pregnant, she couldn't resist the call of battle. Just because she was pregnant, with no visible bump, how could she rest? Lady Inowen, the weapons you want to repair, I have already made for you, Walk hurriedly turned to get the weapons. In the meantime, Chris said, Lady Inowen, with the bloodline of the majesty still in your body, it's best to stay in the dragon's lair and wait for our good news. He really didn't understand why the majesty agreed for Lady Inowen to join the battle. If she wasn't pregnant, Chris could understand, but since Lady Inowen was pregnant, why agree? The dark elves will not be stopped by anything. Please believe in my strength, Chris. Besides, I believe that a child with both the bloodlines of the Red Dragon and the Dark Elves must be more eager for battle than me. Enowen gently touched her slightly bulging belly and smiled. Chris glanced at Enowen's belly, his mouth twitched involuntarily. Could this princess really be eager for battle while still in her belly? Lady Enowen, your weapons are here. Walk returned to Enowen's side with two huge curved swords. These were Enowen's previous weapons. However, due to various battles, they had been severely worn out. So Enowen simply handed them to the goblins to help repair. Thank you, Walk. Enowen looked at the beautifully repaired swords in front of her and said with satisfaction. Finally, they didn't look as shabby as before. No need to thank me, Lady Enowen, this is what I should do, Walk quickly waved his hand. The goblins' work within the West Shepherd clan involved raising livestock and horses, preparing food, and maintaining and crafting weapons. Apart from that, they hardly did anything else. In simple terms, they did odd jobs. They could receive protection without going to the battlefield, a good deal that the goblins enjoyed. This also applied to the upcoming battle with humans, the goblins didn't need to go to the front lines. Based on their numbers and strength, they were better off staying in the rear to provide supplies and logistics. Well, I'm off, Anawan waved her hand, slung her twin swords, and left. Walk, by the way, are the materials our clan uses to make weapons just ordinary iron ore? Chris remembered this important matter. Yes, leader Chris. Hmm, I see. 
After receiving Walker's reply, Chris thought that when invading human towns, he would need to plunder some materials to make weapons. In the early morning, just as the sun was rising, the monsters of the West Shepherd clan began to get busy. The dark elves led the horses out of the stables. These were their own mounts. The wild horses in the forest were taller and more robust than those domesticated by humans, making them suitable mounts for dark elves and most humanoid monsters. Although not as fierce as riding wolves, they were fast and suitable for charging infantry, making them better in some ways than riding wolves. The king shouldn't have awakened at this time, right? Do we need to wait for the king to wake up? Of course, without orders, who would dare to leave the dragon's lair? No need to wait, the king is resting. While the monsters were discussing, Chris rode a wolf and arrived in front of everyone. Chief Chris? What do you mean by that? Asked the bear goblin Chief Bada, who didn't quite understand. Chris, who was once the most respected by the king, was acting out of character today. The monster chiefs all looked at Chris. Don't overthink it. The king told me earlier, before dawn arrived, that for this attack on the human town, there was no need to wait for the great king's orders, and I would be in charge. Chris rode the wolf, looking down on everyone. This had never happened before with the king, so choosing to do so today must be some kind of signal. Chris had not yet figured out what that signal was. Are the elves of the Dark Moon tribe ready? Anowin shouted. We are ready, Queen Anowin, we can depart at any time, reported Mira. The other monster chiefs began their final preparations upon seeing this. Chris patiently waited in place. When all the monsters looked at him, he raised his fist and shouted, Tear them apart. The monsters echoed, Tear them apart. Tear them apart. Even the dark elves were swept up in the chant. It's time for the West Shepherd clan to deliver a heavy blow to them, a nightmare they will never forget. All warriors, tear them apart. Chris raised his fist high. Tear them apart. Tear them apart. The monsters all shouted in unison. Just as the monsters were getting riled up, Wendelin appeared, rubbing her sleepy eyes and holding a cute teddy bear doll. This was a gift stolen by the goblins when they went to the human city to present to Gwendolyn. Princess Gwendolyn, why are you here? Chris was surprised. Little Gwendolyn, what are you doing here? Where are mom and dad? Anowen quickly dismounted and ran to Gwendolyn. Mom and dad are still sleeping. I was woken up by your shouting and wanted to come out and see. Aunt Anowen, what were you saying about plundering something just now? Gwendolyn asked curiously. Fully awake now, she had vaguely heard Chris talking about plundering something when she came out. Gee, Princess Gwendolyn, we were planning to plunder fun toys and pretty clothes for you. Chris quickly came up with an excuse. Talking about plundering treasures from human towns to Princess Gwendolyn would surely be incomprehensible. Just tell Gwendolyn directly that looting is not afraid to corrupt Gwendolyn. Joking, his majesty is the evil dragon himself, and the monsters in the entire West Shepherd clan are chaotic and evil representatives. Gwendolyn is also his majesty's offspring. Chris is not worried at all that Gwendolyn will be corrupted, as she grew up in a den of villains. Toys and clothes? Great. Then go ahead. Indeed, Gwendolyn's focus is not on looting at all, but on the toys and clothes mentioned by Chris. She understands the meaning of looting, but it means nothing to her. Ha 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 don't worry, Princess Gwendolyn, I will definitely bring them to you. Chris laughed heartily. As long as the princess is happy. In the past half month, the princess has grown, at least not feeling scared upon seeing herself. By the way, Chris, can you bring back more magic wands? Mom and I always share one magic wand. Every time mom uses it, then I can use it. Gwendolyn said with a hint of grievance. Magic wands? Of course, no problem, Princess Gwendolyn. Chris assured. A normal human town would definitely not lack magic wands. There will be as many as needed. As for the quality, Chris cannot guarantee. All right, little Gwendolyn, go back to sleep quickly. Enowen sighed in her heart. Although she had been with the West Shepherd clan for half a year, she still felt a bit uneasy about teaching such a young child to steal. After all, the Dark Elves are a chaotic and kind race, and it's a bit uncomfortable. Okay, Aunt Enowen, I'll go back to sleep now. Chris, keep your voice down if you wake up mom and dad, you'll be in trouble. Gwendolyn left the sentence and happily ran back to the dragon's lair. Chris watched Gwendolyn's departing figure and couldn't help but wipe the sweat off his forehead. Let's go. Enowen returned to her horse. Everyone. Cough. Remembering Princess Gwendolyn's words, Chris, who had originally wanted to continue shouting, hurriedly lowered his voice, let's go the monsters looked at each other, the walking monsters sneaked away, and the cavalry rode their mounts slowly behind. Having a child at home is different. Anyone, walking behind, saw this scene and couldn't help but smile. Quite interesting. The chaotic and evil monsters are different from the rumors. At least in a big family, everyone gets along peacefully. 
If someone is bullied, they will help you bully back. Much stronger than some weak righteous guys. Let's go anyone's movements became lighter. The mounts were sensible and made no noise, and the monster army of the West Shepherd clan left the dragon's lair cautiously. When they were a distance away from the dragon's lair, everyone's movements suddenly accelerated. Dust flew, thick smoke billowed, and yellow sand filled the woods. After all the monster army had left, West Shepherd walked out of the dragon's lair and looked in the direction where his monster army had left. Your Majesty, are you going to follow along? Sylvia followed West Shepherd's footsteps. With such a big commotion outside, Gwendolyn was already awakened, let alone them. Yes, this is my monster army's first battle against humans in capturing a human town. I must go and see. Similarly, West Shepherd wanted to understand the human combat methods on this continent for his future invasion of the Red Kingdom. I understand, your majesty. You go, the dragon's lair has me. Sylvia gently leaned against Westwood and touched his dragon scales. Gwendolyn is now your responsibility. Most of the monsters have left the Dokafa Mountains, so try to stay near the dragon's lair and avoid the forest. It wouldn't be good to encounter wild beasts, Westwood reminded with concern. The intelligent monsters in the Dokafa Mountains have all been taken down by the Westwood clan, leaving only some ordinary beasts. These beasts are not very bright and won't care about your status. Unless you are large enough to scare them, they will attack you. I understand this, Sylvia said softly. Leave it to me, Westwood. You can rest assured. Your Majesty the Red Dragon the goblins who stayed near the dragon's lair saw their king appear and quickly came to pay their respects to Westwood. Your duty is to protect Sylvia. Do you understand? Westwood looked down at the small goblins. Yes, your majesty. In fact, the goblins were well aware of their duty without Westwood having to say it. Besides supplying the leader Chris, their duty was to protect Princess Gwendolyn and Lady Sylvia. Because Sylvia was by his side, Westwood flapped his wings lightly this time, not stirring up a strong wind. Sylvia raised her head and watched Westwood leave until he disappeared on the horizon, then gradually lowered her head. I wish you all the best. Your Majesty, Sylvia clasped her hands together and prayed for Westwood. Lady Sylvia, Walk approached Sylvia a little hesitantly. What is it? Sylvia asked. You know our goblin strength. Compared to leader Chris and the others, we are nothing, so please stay near the dragon's lair and don't wander around. Walk was afraid that Lady Sylvia and Princess Gwendolyn would encounter danger if they went outside. With the goblin's strength, they might not be able to explain to King Westwood. I know. Just focus on your own tasks. I won't leave the vicinity of the dragon's lair, only going to the training ground to teach little Gwendolyn magic. As a qualified companion, Sylvia knew how to act so as not to cause trouble for her man. Be obedient, responsible for oneself. It's great that you understand. Lady Sylvia, we will take our leave. Walk was going to take the goblins to feed the livestock. Halfway there, Walk suddenly remembered something and turned back to ask, Lady Sylvia, what would you and the princess like to eat this morning? Anything is fine, Sylvia had no dietary restrictions. It had been a long time since she had eaten vegetables, but unfortunately, the monsters did not cultivate any. When feeling that her stomach was not digesting well, the monsters would eat some weeds from the nearby lawn. The Dokafa Mountains were vast. Coupled with Chris leading many monsters, it took them nearly a whole day to approach the human town. After a day of marching, everyone was tired, and Chris knew that now was not the time for battle. He arranged for everyone to camp and rest in place. A bonfire quickly rose in the camp, shining a beacon of hope in the darkness of the night. The monster leaders all sat around a fire pit. That is the human town over there. Judging from their situation, they probably haven't noticed us, Bada pointed to a nearby location. Through the dense forest, faint candlelight could be seen coming from the human town, shining like twinkling fireflies in the dark night, attracting attention. That's for sure, if they found us, they would have been scared off long ago how when the monsters heard this, they couldn't stop laughing. They had never formally fought with humans before, so they looked down on the weak and skinny humans from the bottom of their hearts. They believed that with the human strength, they would never be able to withstand their attacks. There was a huge difference in size alone. Humans are indeed thin and fragile, but don't forget, they are able to hold a place on this continent for a reason. Don't underestimate them too much. Chris first smiled, then warned everyone not to be too complacent. Being too complacent leads to defeat. Soon, the monsters quieted down. Chris, since we are attacking the human town tomorrow, why not let the forest giant eagles go to the human town first to check the situation? It's already dark now, as long as the giant eagles fly higher, they won't be discovered. Enowen suggested her own idea. Enowen is right, I was just thinking the same. Damel, I leave the reconnaissance to your falcon tribe, I hope you won't disappoint me and Enowen. Chris glanced at Damel. 
Please rest assured, Chris Leader and Enowen, leave it to us. Damel quickly led the giant eagles and flew towards the human town under the cover of night. Human town watchtower what do you think of that woman? Very impressive, remember to take me there next time. Haha <laughs> forget it, Hans, your monthly salary is just enough for one play. That's fine, anyway, our army provides food and shelter, it doesn't matter. A group of soldiers hid in the watchtower, each one drunk and boasting. As soldiers on guard duty, drinking alcohol was strictly prohibited. What if the enemy launched a surprise attack? But for soldiers who had not seen war for a long time, they had already relaxed their vigilance. As long as they were not discovered by the sergeant, they could do whatever they wanted. Everyone knew not to snitch on each other. What they didn't know was that a group of forest giant eagles had flown over their heads and were circling and inspecting the town. This human town was not very large, probably no more than a few thousand people. The number of soldiers definitely would not exceed 3,000, probably at most 1 or 2,000. Having obtained the information they wanted, Damo led the giant eagles back to Chris and reported everything truthfully. Those humans are completely unaware of the impending danger. Enowen wiped the dust off her double-edged sword. It was a bit disappointing for her. Isn't that good? Lady Enowen, the more they are like this, the more advantageous it is for us. The army probably numbers around 1 to 2,000, we have over a thousand monsters, the advantage is on our side. Chris said confidently. Even if there were over 3,000 human soldiers, Chris felt no nervousness or fear. The only thing to be cautious of were the magic users and priests among the humans. 2,000. 1,000, Chris Leader, if I'm not mistaken, our numbers are fewer than theirs. Bada counted his fingers. How can this be considered an advantage for us? Are you stupid, Bada? Don't forget, our bodies are much stronger than humans, one against three is no problem, right? Chris flexed his strong biceps. He had fought with the human guards before, and it was simple and easy. Don't be angry, Chris Leader, the bear goblin's brain is just stupid, Damel said. Who are you calling stupid? Damel, believe me, I'll pluck all the feathers off you. Bada, upon hearing Damel call him stupid, immediately retorted. The forest giant eagle is just relying on its ability to fly. If it could fly, it would definitely soar into the sky and pluck off Damar's feathers. You? Whether you can fly up here is another matter, Damar said disdainfully from the tree branch. Humph, Bada knew he had no way to deal with Damar, so he just snorted without saying anything. Continuing this argument would only lead to his own disadvantage. We are about to battle humans tomorrow, and you are arguing at this time? Enowen said impatiently. Rest assured, Lady Enowen, this is just how we are. Despite the quarrel now, we won't hold back in battle, Chris said with a light smile. Monsters arguing was a common occurrence, and it wouldn't affect the battle tomorrow. When he was conquering other monster tribes, he even had an argument with his deputy. Yet during the battle, they still trusted each other with their backs, showing the trust among monsters. There wasn't much calculation involved. Do as you please. Since his majesty has entrusted you with command, do not disappoint him. I will go rest first, Enowen sheathed her dual blades and went to rest in her temporary tent. She indeed did not understand this group of monsters. With command not in her hands, she wouldn't interfere too much in Chris's affairs, even with her lady status. This was something both Sylvia and Enowen were wise about. They never used their lady status to pressure any monsters. Lady Enowen is resting, so stop arguing and go back to sleep, Chris kicked the nearest Bada beside him. He lay down next to the fire, using soft leaves as a pillow, and began to snore loudly. Except for the dark elves who set up temporary tents, the monsters all slept by the fire, with a few taking turns to keep watch. As the morning light hit Chris's face, he opened his eyes. Looking around, he saw that Lady Enowen and the dark elves were already awake, dismantling the temporary tents they had set up. Awake? I had the forest giant eagle scout again. The human town is quiet, they should still be asleep. It's a good opportunity now, Enowen reminded Chris. They could catch the humans off guard. Thank you, Lady Enowen. When we return to the dragon's lair, I will make sure to tell his majesty about your help in detail, Chris said, not seeking to take all the credit. Let's wait until you have taken down this human town for his majesty before discussing this matter, Enowen said impatiently. They hadn't even captured the human town yet, and Chris was already making such bold statements. What if they failed? Hee hee, I understand, Lady Enowen, Chris got up and kicked the nearby monster. Get up! Don't sleep! The monsters were awakened one by one, shaking their heads to clear their minds. To wake up quickly, most monsters would use their hands to slap their faces. With their tough skin, they weren't afraid of getting swollen. After a while, Leader Chris, we are all ready to go, we can depart at any time. I can't wait to taste human brain marrow. Just thinking about it makes my mouth water. The monsters were eager to try. 
Although with our strength, humans are no match for us, but to minimize casualties, we must not be reckless, Chris stood on a rock and slowly explained his plan. After hearing Chris's plan, everyone quickly sprang into action. Near the walls of the human town, some jackal people stealthily approached the wall, cautiously looking up at the watchtower. This was the blind spot of the watchtower, it seemed the sentries hadn't noticed them, or they would have sounded the alarm long ago. The jackal people took out their claws from their backs, swung them in their hands, and threw them forcefully at the wall above their heads. The claws successfully stuck to the wall. The walls of the human town were about 8 meters high, designed to prevent monsters. After tugging on the claws to ensure they were secure, the jackal people climbed up along the rope of the claws. The soldiers who were dreaming did not notice at all that the monsters had infiltrated their town. A Oowa soldier was about to unzip his pants to urinate. In the darkness, a pair of sharp claws reached out and quickly covered his mouth, dragging him inside. MMM. The poor soldier was so scared that his eyes widened, and before he could make a sound, the jackal person slit his throat. Don't eat him. There will be plenty of humans for you later. Don't delay Chief Chris's plan, and don't forget how much the king values us jackal people. Seeing a companion tempted to eat the soldier's body, a jackal person interrupted. As long as they took over this human town, there would be enough humans for each monster to have three or four. Oh the greedy jackal person reluctantly nodded. The jackal team quietly approached the side of the gate, untied the rope of the gate, and slowly opened the huge gate. The sound of the gate opening instantly woke up the soldiers who were sleeping nearby. Who is opening the gate? Oh no! It's monsters! Monsters! How did the jackal people get in? Help! Help! Ah! The soldiers rushed out in a panic and were all shocked when they saw the jackal people, not knowing what to do. They had no idea where this group of jackal people had come from. Outside, Chris, who was waiting outside, saw the gate open and immediately shouted, Charge! Kill! The monster cavalry charged ahead, riding their mounts into the forefront. The jackal people who sneaked in to open the gate were the first to engage with the human soldiers, preventing them from closing the gate. Want to close the gate? There is no gate! The jackal people swung their iron hammers and axes, officially engaging in battle with the humans. The brave jackal people had the upper hand against the slender human soldiers, forcing them to keep their distance. For a moment, the human soldiers could not approach the gate to close it. The horn of the human town echoed through the silent city. Enemy attack! Enemy attack! Roar! At the next moment, Chris led the cavalry into the town. Swinging his heavy iron axe, accompanied by the momentum of his mount, he swiftly chopped off the head of a human soldier in front of him. The head flew in the air, splattering hot red blood at the point of separation. The battle had officially begun. Blades clashed, and the flames of war burned. The entrance of the city gate was quickly stained red with blood, and the smell of blood filled the air. Dark elves? Why are dark elves among the monsters? A soldier was shocked to discover the presence of dark elves. Weren't these dark elves a chaotic and kind race? Why were they attacking their human town alongside the chaotic and evil monsters? He couldn't recall any conflicts between his people and the dark elves. But before he could think further, Enowan's sharp curved blade struck. The soldier quickly raised his sword to block. Clang! Dazzling sparks flew. The soldier was sent flying by the powerful impact, crashing heavily into the hard wall, feeling his back splitting apart. Before he could stand up again, Enowan leaped down from his mount. Using the sharp edge of the curved blade, he vertically inserted it into the soldier's exposed neck, ending his life. For the glory of the king, Inowen pulled out the blood-stained blade, inspiring her Dark Moon tribe. She knew that the night elves in her tribe had never fought humans before, and facing such a bloody scene, they might be very uncomfortable. So as the queen of the Dark Moon tribe, Inowen had to lead by example. Let everyone understand that the night elves also have courage. As monsters and human soldiers clashed, more and more human soldiers began to arrive. Looking around, there were probably more than 2,000 people. It seemed that Damar's estimate was correct. Just these 2,000 people alone would be unable to withstand such terrifying monsters. Just when the situation seemed one-sided. Boom! A scorching fireball smashed into the midst of the monsters. Dozens of monsters were blasted, limbs broken, skin charred by flames, writhing in pain on the ground. It's a mage! Chris killed the enemy in front of him, his eyes scanning the human side. Searching for the mage's whereabouts. They had to find the mage, or their casualties would be significant. Have Damar take action. Inowen shouted. Yes, Lady Inowen. Chris put his hand to his mouth, sending a sharp whistle into the sky. The forest giant eagles circling in the sky heard Chris's whistle command. It's our turn, lads. Damar led the forest giant eagles to swoop down, launching a surprise attack on the human soldiers. Oh no. There are more in the sky. 
What are the sentinels doing? Damn it! Damn it! The giant talons and strength of the forest giant eagles could easily snatch a human soldier in midair and then drop them from a height. Even fully armed soldiers would not escape death from such a fall. The human archers quickly aimed at the sky, causing casualties among the forest giant eagles. Boom! The explosion of flames rang out in the monster pile again. I see you now. Chris noticed the source of the flames this time, his gaze quickly focusing on the area behind the human soldiers. There were more than 20 guys in mage robes. 20 mages could be dealt with. Lady Inowen, the human mages are back there, be careful. Taking the opportunity, Chris hid behind a stone pillar and said to Inowen nearby. Chris, this kind of battle is not favorable for us, we must deal with the mages. Damar and the forest giant eagles clearly did not understand Chris's meaning. They only knew to attack the soldiers in front, not to go after the more dangerous mages behind. What do you mean? Chris asked. As long as we get close, the mages will have no way out. Before the words had finished, Inowen, like an assassin, moved through the crowd, harvesting lives while continuously approaching the mages. This. This is too reckless. Wait for me. Lady Inowen. Bada, have your goblin bear go to the left flank, Tux, have your werewolves go to the right flank, and the rest of the monsters continue to attack from the front. Chris couldn't let Inowen go alone. His duty was to protect Lady Inowen. He really didn't understand why Lady Inowen was so reckless. Up ahead, Inowen abandoned the twin blades passed down from her Darkmoon tribe ancestors and drew the sword at her waist. This was specially crafted for her by the goblins. Flow south. Vigorously. Poochie. Ah. A dark purple sword aura was swung out by Inowen. The moment the sword aura touched the row of soldiers in front of her, their armor was torn apart like tofu by the sword aura. Accompanied by the soldiers' screams, the row of soldiers in front of them were all cut in half at the waist, blood spraying from the severed waist. That's a senior swordsman. It's a swordsman from the southern flow. Her target is the mages. Don't let her get close. Enowen's sudden sword aura stunned the human soldiers. Soon they could see Enowen's sword style. As one of the four most well-known styles on the continent, how could they not recognize it? When the soldiers knew that Enowen's target was the mages, they quickly gathered together, becoming shields in front of the mages, protecting them tightly. Wind, heed my call. Dispel the evil in front of us, Gale Arrow. Swish. An arrow made of wind elements shot out from the mage's staff, swiftly heading towards Enowen. Well done, dissipate for me. Boom. A strong wind instantly raised dust, covering Enowen's figure. Lady Enowen. Chris shouted in concern. The next moment, the wind blew away the dust, and Enowen stood in front of everyone and scathed, holding her sword ready to strike. Is this all your strength? Enowen's seductive red lips curved into a smile, her beautiful eyes filled with mockery towards human mages. Although mages were indeed powerful, the dominant figures on this continent were still professions like melee fighters. The reason was simple, the chanting time and close combat weaknesses of mages were always a big drawback. Few Chris breathed a sigh of relief seeing Enowen unharmed. It seemed he had underestimated the strength of his lady Enowen. If he had taken that gale arrow just now, it wouldn't have been pleasant. The monsters had not practiced any swordsmanship, relying solely on their bloodline for strength. Protect the mages for me, I will deal with that dark elf swordsman. A tall and imposing human stepped forward. His armor was clearly better than the surrounding soldiers. He was the captain of the human town's army, Bestori. Yes, captain. Seeing their captain going to face the fearsome dark elf swordsman, the other soldiers breathed a sigh of relief. Most human soldiers were just ordinary people who had practiced a bit of physical skills. Not everyone had the talent for learning swordsmanship. Some people spent their whole lives and only reached the level of a lower swordsman. They were slightly better than ordinary people, unable to even unleash sword aura. I can sense sword intent from you, what is your name? Enowen held her long sword with one hand, giving Chris a glance not far away. Chris understood Enowen's intention and quickly rode his wolf away from there. Best story, to be honest, I am surprised that you, a dark elf, would help this group of ruthless monsters. Bestori saw a chance to talk with Enowen and took the initiative to start a conversation, trying to see if he could persuade Enowen to leave with her dark elf companions through words. Well, I didn't really want to invade your human town, but they called me Lady Enowen. Enowen shrugged. She was already under the command of the Red Dragon King and the Matriarch of the West Shepherd Clan. Who else would come to help if not her? And Matriarch? Bestori's pupils shrank, his face shocked. What's going on? This dark elf in front of him became a companion of monsters? At this moment, Bestori did not know that Enowen's companion was actually a red dragon, thinking it was just a more powerful monster. It was really strange, a chaotic and kind dark elf becoming the companion of chaotic and evil monsters. 
The great sun god above, I must not be dreaming. Bestori felt like pinching himself a bit. Don't say so much, you already know the truth. Come and fight, let me see how much strength you have. Enowen had long wanted to fight swordsmen of other races, especially the humans who created the four major swordsmanship styles. Dark Elf, there is no need for us to fight, I don't know why you became a companion of monsters, but we can still be friends. Take your Dark Elves and leave, when we have eliminated these monsters, we will definitely engage in trade and exchange with your Dark Elves, help you. Too much nonsense. Before Bestori could finish speaking, Enowen impatiently rushed forward with her sword drawn. Clang. Bestori hurriedly drew his sword to defend, barely blocking Enowen's sudden attack. Seeing the attack being blocked, Enowen was not discouraged, but rather more excited. Finally, she encountered an opponent who wouldn't be defeated in one move. In an instant, Enowen's attack speed increased, the principle of the southern flow swordsmanship was to attack extremely fast, making the enemy unable to keep up, revealing a flaw, and then delivering a fatal blow. Indeed, you are a swordsman of the southern flow. But, don't underestimate the shepherd style. Bestori and Enowen were both high-level swordsmen, with Bestori's strength not far behind Enowen's. The levels of swordsmen are, apprentice, lower, middle, upper, grand swordsman, sword king, sword saint, sword god. Sword kings have the strength to fight thousands alone and are known as imperial level strongmen. Generally, such individuals are generals leading the kingdom's army. However, there may be some sword kings with unique personalities, such as enjoying being bodyguards or wandering around, unwilling to stay in one place. The shepherd style's principle is to use great strength to attack, abandoning defense, and using one's most powerful force to prevent the opponent from defending, as offense is the best defense. So you are a swordsman of the shepherd style, I have fought against the shepherd style before. Enowen was even more delighted. It seemed she had not come in vain this time. While the two high-level swordsmen were fighting, Chris led the wolf cavalry to ignore the attacks from the magicians and forcibly pushed aside the soldiers blocking the magicians. Ah! Run! The monsters are breaking through! Help me! Help me! Roar! A magician who couldn't escape was pounced on by the wolf under Chris, and began to frantically bite at his neck and chest. Blood splattered, and the entrails were torn out by the wolf's mouth. With the loss of magician support, the human soldiers were quickly overwhelmed by the monster's crushing strength. Don't kill me. I'm willing to drop my weapon. Some human soldiers even threw down their only life-saving weapons, begging the monsters to spare them. But they were too optimistic. Monsters are not human, and the monsters, already bloodthirsty, paid no attention to the idea of human surrender. It was better to throw away the weapons, making it easier for them to consume their prey without disarming them. Ah! Screams echoed across the battlefield, cries of agony continued. Remember, the uglier the female human, the less you should kill. Kill all the others. As a loyal lackey of the Western Shepherd, Chris would not forget what his majesty wanted in companions. How could the great red dragon majesty have only two companions? This time in the human town, they must bring back several good main mothers no matter what. Chris had become smarter, thinking that the uglier the human in the eyes of the monsters, the more attractive they would be in the eyes of his majesty, so everything should be done in reverse. Understood. Chief Chris. The monsters excitedly rushed into the town. In just a moment, the sounds of human screams and things being smashed came from the house. Chris did not join in for the moment, as he needed to check on Lady Enowen's situation. On the other side, when the monsters saw all the magicians fall, they started to harm the residents behind them. Besterin was thrown into panic. The shepherd's flow is not meant to be used like this. Lady Enowen was disappointed. As a proud user of the offensive shepherd's flow, Besterin was hesitant and did not show the true meaning of the shepherd's flow. No. With a crack, Besterin, who had completely lost his will to fight, was mercilessly beheaded by Lady Enowen in a terrified gaze. His strength was still there, but due to long-term indulgence in alcohol and pleasure, he could barely hold a sword now. Coupled with his poor mental state, he was no match for Lady Enowen, a fellow top swordsman, and was defenseless after just 10 rounds. Wonderful absolutely wonderful, Lady Enowen, you are like the bright moon in the sky, with the stars twinkling for you. Chris half knelt in front of Lady Enowen, starting to flatter her. As long as I, Chris, am your superior, everything can be flattered. Forget it, Chris, save your flattery for his majesty, I'm not interested. Lady Enowen walked to Besterin's body and picked up his sword. This sword was engraved with some patterns, shining silver under the sunlight. Lady Enowen could tell at a glance that this sword was made of different material, much better than the one she was using. Since it was her spoils of war, Lady Enowen didn't hesitate to put it away. It just so happened that she could give her original sword blade to Gwendolyn for training. You're not dead, Bada. Chris chuckled. 
Humph relying on these humans, they still want to kill me? Bada kicked away the bodies of the human soldiers in front of him. After killing these human soldiers, he happily feasted. Forest eagles descended from the sky, using their curved beaks to peck at the human bodies. Enjoying this rare lunch. Leader Chris, almost all the humans in the human town have been killed, leaving only these women we find quite ugly. A jackal man ran to Chris's side, pointing to the group of women behind him. Roughly counting, there were about a dozen women, all trembling with their heads down, afraid to look at the monsters. These women were very frightened, now all in the hands of the monsters. Although they didn't know why they weren't killed, they felt that their lives were probably coming to an end. Well done, indeed quite ugly. Chris nodded in satisfaction. Ugly? Chris, what kind of eyes do you have? Aren't these women quite decent? Lady Enowan said in surprise. Hearing Chris call those women ugly, she rubbed her eyes in disbelief. Although the appearance of these women was not that of celestial beauties, they were still above average. Yet Chris called them ugly? Does that mean she is ugly too? Lady Enowan, you may not understand our jackal people's aesthetics. To me, these tender flesh folks are all ugly, only. Someone like her is what we consider a great beauty. Chris was about to give an example when he saw a female jackal person from his own group walk over. He quickly pointed at her. The female jackal person was not much less slender than the male jackal person, with a fierce wolf head licking blood at the corner of her mouth. The hair behind her head was all bunched up. Looking at this appearance of the jackal person, Lady Enowen suddenly felt goosebumps. She was not even as good as Chris in this regard. All right, you're right, Chris. Anyone no longer has any thoughts of arguing aesthetics with Chris. She still needs to go help the cute little Doran get some magic wands and magic books. Chris Leader, what if his majesty doesn't like it after finding so many mothers? The Knoll brother worried. It's simple, just kill them all, and we can have a good meal as well, Chris said, tapping the Knoll brother's head with his hand. It's best if his majesty doesn't like it, so he doesn't have to call so many mothers. On the streets of the town, there were bloodstains that had not dried up, as well as scattered limbs and chunks of flesh everywhere. Anyone endured the nausea and arrived at the blood-covered library entrance. She pushed the door open. Roar ha? Huh? Lady Anyone. As soon as she walked in, she could hear the monster's low growls. When the monsters turned around and saw Anyone, they put away their attacking postures one by one, dragged their food to the corner, and slowly savored it. Anyone, who saw this scene for the first time, even as the queen of the Dark Moon tribe, found it hard to bear, it was really disgusting. Especially the lingering smell of blood in the air made her frown frequently. Taking a deep breath, Anyone covered her nose and mouth as she walked to the bookshelf, wiped away the bloodstains on it, and began to browse the books. On the other side, Chris and the other monsters also began to search for usable items. Chris, is this what Princess Gwendolyn wants? Bang! Bada kicked hard, and the wooden door fell down with a crash. Inside the house were placed fluffy little dolls. These should be the toys the princess mentioned. Yes, that's it. Chris hurried over, his eyes gradually lighting up. Bringing all these things back, Princess Gwendolyn will surely be very happy, right? If the princess is happy, his majesty will surely be pleased too, he was really clever. With so many dolls, how do we take them back? Bada asked. Fool, don't humans have carts for transporting goods? Just use a cart to take them back, and make sure the kids don't eat the horses pulling the cart. Whoever eats the horses pulling the cart will be the one to pull the cart for me. Chris really understood the monster's personalities. If he didn't remind them, they would probably rush to eat the horse's first thing next to the cart. Please rest assured, leader Chris, we are not that stupid. The monsters shrank their necks. They were about to do just that. After about two hours, all the monsters gathered at the city gate. The carts used by humans to transport goods were all pulled here by the monsters, filled with various fluffy toys. Another part contained the spoils of the monsters, hundreds of magic wands, excellent equipment, forging materials. War is indeed a good way to get rich. After this battle, the resources of the West Shepherd clan soared. Many things were not available in the Dokafa Mountains. With such rich spoils of war, his majesty will definitely be very happy when he sees them, Chris said proudly with his hands on his hips. He couldn't wait to go back and present his achievements to his majesty. This time, they brought out about a thousand monsters, with over a hundred casualties, which was a very good casualty ratio. After all, look at all the human soldiers who were killed, not a single one left. It reflects that the strength of this human town is not very strong. Roar. No need, Chris, I have seen it. Well done, my most loyal hound. The majestic dragon's aura swept through the audience. The huge red dragon descended from the sky, reflected in the eyes of the monsters. The blood-colored patterns in the gaps of the dragon scales were emitting a red light, 
and the flames on its body seem like dancing fire spirits, celebrating this king. Your majesty, the red dragon. Thump 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 the monsters, upon seeing their king appear in this moment, all instinctively knelt down. Everyone looked at each other, none had expected the king from the dragon's lair to appear on this battlefield. The king's appearance was truly unexpected. Great King Zimu, no wonder even the scorching sun in the sky dimmed for a moment, it turns out the greatest deity has descended before me. Chris quickly flattered with a smile. Chris was indeed Chris, while others would bow upon seeing Zimu, his first action was to pat the dragon's butt. But this gesture pleased Zimu greatly. Speak more if you can. Chris, you did well this time, would you like a reward? Zimu was a witness to the battle. From high above, he could see every move on the ground. He watched the war from a god's perspective. Although it was Chris's first time invading a human town, he did well, not underestimating the humans. Instead, he chose a relatively safe strategy. If it were other monsters, they probably wouldn't even think of sneaking into the city to open the gates. They would definitely choose to force their way in and break down the city gates. To follow by your side, your majesty, is the greatest reward for me. Chris was smart not to mention any reward. He was afraid that if he asked for too much, he would appear greedy and worsen the king's impression of him. The best approach was to throw the question back to King Zimu. Let the king make the decision. Even if it was something he didn't like, he would accept it without complaint. Then wait until we return to the dragon's lair to reward you properly. The crimson vertical pupils of the dragon shimmered, and Zimu had high hopes for Chris's future development. Thank you, your majesty. Chris nodded. Your majesty, these are the spoils we found, which should be very helpful to the Zimu clan. Enowen introduced these items. Most were meant to enhance the Zimu clan's strength, with a few clothes and toys for Sylvia and Gwendolyn. Hmm, I understand. Let's return to the dragon's lair. Zimu gently flapped his dragon wings, creating a gust of wind as he prepared to leave. Wait. Your majesty, there is one more thing. Chris called out. What is it? Chris, in the future, get to the point when you speak to me, don't just boast, understand? Zimu said impatiently. He was about to take off, and Chris was saying all this. Well, great majesty, there are some humans I found as companions for you, not sure if you like them? If you do, bring them back to the Zimu clan, if not, I can dispose of them now. Chris's original idea was to bring these dozen women back to the dragon's lair and let the king decide. Now that the king was here, it was better to make a decision now. If he didn't like them, he didn't want to bother bringing them back, just dispose of them on the spot. Companions you found for me? The crimson vertical pupils of Zimu slightly narrowed as his gaze swept over the dozen women. Their looks were indeed good, not as good as Sylvia and Enowen, but among humans, they were considered above average. Bring them back then. More offspring meant more blessings, and Zimu's power would grow rapidly. So naturally, Zimu accepted them all. With the abilities of a dragon, not to mention a dozen women, even hundreds would be more than enough. Yes. Chris's face lit up. I really didn't think wrong. They think that the ugly human women are very beautiful in his majesty's eyes. Chris, you are a genius. Chris secretly praised himself in his heart. The only headache now is that when he goes back, there are so many mistresses to call, which is a bit troublesome. It's better not to meet with this group of mistresses in the future, so as not to be cumbersome. In addition, he still has to flatter and boast, which is quite brain-burning. This human town should be destroyed. Shimu squinted his eyes, staring at the human town in front of him. Since the monsters have almost destroyed it, it's better to destroy it completely. Roar! In an instant, the fierce flames on the red dragon's body jumped up, and the burning flames surrounded Shimu, forming a circle of hot fire. The spectacular fire ring was like a divine ring, reflecting Shimu's majestic figure. The intense heat distorted the surrounding space, causing the monsters around to retreat in fear, afraid of being burned by the flames. Destruction Fire Ring At the moment of releasing the dragon language magic, the ring of fire behind Shimu rose into the air and burst open, turning into strands of hot sparks that fell from the sky towards the human town. Bang! Boom! For a moment, the entire human town was engulfed in a sea of fire, gradually being consumed by the flames, like a hell on earth. The fire reflected on the faces of the monsters, leaving them stunned. They had never seen his majesty take action, and they were truly shocked at this moment. So this is the power of their own majesty? Truly the supreme true dragon, truly their uncrowned king. The sturdy walls crumbled under the impact of the fire magic, collapsing into rubble. The debris on the ground was engulfed by the fire, turning into black charcoal, emitting the sound of crackling fat. Roar! Return to the dragon's lair. After doing all this, the roar of the dragon resounded through the sky. Then it soared into the air, flying towards the distant dragon's lair. Awoo! 
follow in the footsteps of His Majesty. Chris shouted excitedly. The former Majesty has returned. When His Majesty comes of age, he will definitely be able to avenge that female red dragon. Chris will not forget this grudge. Is this the true power of the dragon? No wonder it is hailed as one of the most terrifying creatures on the continent. Anyone exclaimed in amazement. Then riding their mounts, they followed Shimu's direction as he flew away. The vast army of monsters, following in the footsteps of the dragon, left the battlefield. One day later, all the monsters returned to the dragon's lair. Sylvia led the monsters to welcome the return of the king with Gwendolyn. Your majesty, you're finally back Sylvia smiled gently. The faces of the monsters were full of smiles, and the number did not seem to have decreased significantly. She roughly guessed that the battle should have been won. They couldn't be so happy if they had lost. Daddy! Gwendolyn ran to Shimu's feet with her cute little feet. She opened her small hands and gave Shimu a big hug. Little Gwendolyn, did you listen to mommy when I was away? Shimu affectionately lowered his body and gently scratched Gwendolyn's head with his tail. The only one who could make this red dragon voluntarily lower his body was probably his daughter. Of course, daddy, Gwendolyn always listens to mommy. Gwendolyn replied obediently. During the time daddy was away, the most she did was practice magic with mommy in the training ground and learn some new magic knowledge. Well done, Gwendolyn, daddy also brought you many fun things. What is it? Gwendolyn's azure eyes sparkled. King West smiled and turned to Chris, saying, Chris, bring out the things for me. Yes, your majesty. Chris quickly let out a carriage filled with toy dolls. When Gwendolyn saw so many toys in front of her, her eyes widened. Wow, so many toys. Dad is amazing. Gwendolyn couldn't wait to jump into the pile of toys and swim in the ocean of toys. As long as you like it, Gwendolyn, and this was found for you by Chris, King West made sure to give credit to Chris, as the toys were specially collected by him. He wanted Gwendolyn to know how useful Chris was. Not only as an ugly and terrifying jackal man but also as his proud subordinate. Thank you, Chris. Gwendolyn thanked Chris. No, 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 your highness Gwendolyn, this is what I should do. You are a natural shining star, and I am just an ordinary ant on the ground, serving you. Isn't that what I should do? Chris was frightened when Gwendolyn bowed to thank him. Jokingly, he knew that Gwendolyn's status was much higher than his. How could he let Gwendolyn thank him? It was like King West never thanked Chris, it was just something he should do. No mom said that children should be polite. If someone helps you, you should say thank you. That's what a polite child does. Young Gwendolyn clearly did not realize her noble status. I did teach Gwendolyn that, Sylvia said a bit embarrassed. She was always human, so she naturally taught Gwendolyn in a human way. Surely no parent would teach their child to be bad from a young age. Haha <laughs> that's right, Gwendolyn, be a polite and good child. King West laughed heartily, finding things much more interesting with a daughter. Chris didn't know how to explain to Princess Gwendolyn. After a brief exchange at the door, King West led all the monsters from this battle into the dragon's lair. Except for Enowen, who had more important matters to attend to. Enowen, why aren't you going into the dragon's lair? Sylvia asked Enowen, puzzled, as she watched Gwendolyn picking toys by the carriage. She had heard that Enowen had made a significant contribution this time. Since you're here, Sylvia, let me tell you something. Enowen quickly told Sylvia all about the women's situation. After a while, Enowen, what do you mean? Well, those women still don't know what's going on. You're human, so I want you to go with me to see them and explain the current situation. Enowen was worried that if the women did something to anger the king and the monsters while they waited for them to finish their conversation, it wouldn't end well. It was necessary to explain the situation to the women beforehand. If anyone didn't want to serve the great King West, they would be killed on the spot to avoid making the king uncomfortable. Enowen, you're right. We should explain the situation to them first. Sylvia agreed with Enowen's opinion. Disobedience would lead to death, they couldn't afford to displease the king. Let's go. Enowen led Sylvia to the tent where the group of women was being held. The monsters stood guard at the door, providing food and drink to help the women recover quickly. Unfortunately, for the human women in the monster stronghold, they had no appetite for food. They were about to be eaten by the dragon. Rumors about the dragon's preference for human women and elves kept floating in their minds. At that moment, several voices came from outside. Lady Sylvia. Lady Enovin. Hmm, those women are inside. They are here, please rest assured. We want to go in and see them. Of course, please come in. Then Sylvia and Enovin walked into the tent. With the senior swordsman Enovin by her side, Sylvia was not afraid that these women would attack her. Seeing Enovin and Sylvia, the group of women instinctively took a step back in fear and huddled in the corner. 
When they saw Sylvia, a human, some women's eyes showed not only fear but also a hint of confusion. How could a human woman be in a monster's lair? Hello, nice to meet you. I am Sylvia, once a princess of a kingdom. I believe you are familiar with this kingdom, the fallen kingdom of Yar. The human town was originally ruled by the kingdom of Yar, so Sylvia believed that they must have heard of the name of Yar. And since the kingdom of Yar fell less than two years ago, it couldn't have been forgotten so quickly. Indeed, when they heard that Sylvia was the princess of Yar, the fifteen women all showed incredulous expressions. You, you are truly the princess of Yar? One woman asked courageously. Of course, I have no reason to deceive you. You must be familiar with the crown on my head, right? Sylvia pointed to the crown she was wearing, which had a small golden symbol of a lightning bolt, the symbol of the royal family of Yar. She is indeed the princess of Yar. Oh my, how can the princess of Yar be here? Wasn't it said that the entire royal family of Yar was killed? The women whispered among themselves. Ahem, quiet. Enavin shouted. Immediately, the women fell silent. Enavin's imposing presence was too intimidating. Let me tell you about your situation now. Whether you stay or leave, it's up to you. Inside the dragon's lair at this time, Chris did very well. I have seen his performance. Chris, you have the greatest credit among all the monsters. Do you have any objections? Westmoth singled out Chris for praise. No, your majesty, your opinion is our opinion. Yes, your majesty, we all admire Chief Chris. Chief Chris deserves all the credit. The monsters dared not have any objections. After all, the majesty was just joking, right? Those with objections could not join the Westmoth clan. All this is thanks to your majesty's nurturing. Without your majesty, there would be no present Chris. Everything about Chris was bestowed by your majesty. Chris enjoyed the envious glances from the other monster chiefs. He stood tall, feeling extremely proud. Oh, why am I so welcomed by his majesty? Chris, I have decided to grant you a reward. Westmott said. A reward? Thank you, your majesty. Chris was stunned, then ecstatically knelt down. Could it be that his majesty was not just giving verbal praise this time, but actually rewarding him? Although Chris knew that his majesty often made promises he couldn't keep, he was still willing to follow Westmott willingly. Because Westmott was a dragon about to come of age, and when he did, he could bestow upon Chris the supreme red dragon bloodline, leading to evolution. Becoming a dragon blood jackal man. This is enough to make up for any reward. Among the spoils this time, I found a potion left by an alchemist. I checked it and it's something beneficial for you. After the meeting, you can go get it, said Shimo. When he came back, he specifically checked to see if there was anything interesting to note. After his inspection, he did find a few things. One of them was the alchemist's potion of sublimation. It can help unlock a small portion of undeveloped potential in humans, which is equally useful for monsters. Thank you for your reward, your majesty. The radiant light on you makes me want to poke my eyes out. That's enough, Chris. Save those words for later, Shimo interrupted Chris's boasting before it went on. It was getting dark. Yes, yes he he, Chris chuckled. He obediently stood aside. All right, the rewards have all been given to you. You can now leave the dragon's lair and do your own thing. Things were almost settled. Shimo was about to drive away these monster leaders. Yes, your majesty, have a wonderful night. The monster leaders nodded and left the dragon's lair. As they walked out of the lair, the monster leaders expressed their envy towards Chris. Chris, you're really lucky not only did you receive praise from his majesty, but also rewards. We envy your bone crusher tribe. But next time, it will definitely be the barbarian tribe receiving his majesty's rewards. Chief Chris, if there's anything good next time, remember to call us. Don't hog it all for yourself. Don't worry, I'm not a selfish person. If I have a piece of meat, there will definitely be soup for you. Chris chatted politely with the monster leaders for a few moments. Following what his majesty had said, he found the potion of sublimation. In a transparent container the size of a palm, there was a potion emitting a green light. Can this thing really be consumed? Chris, who had never seen a genetic potion before, frowned. His majesty had no reason to harm himself, but the problem was he had never taken such a thing before. What if his body reacted differently from the werewolves? If he died, who would he reason with? Forget it, he believed his majesty wouldn't be mistaken. Chris opened the potion, and a pungent smell entered his nostrils. It was somewhat like the feeling of a corpse decaying in the wild for half a month, very foul, but fortunately werewolves could adapt. Just in case, Chris didn't drink at all, just took a small sip. Gulp after drinking the potion of sublimation, Chris closed his eyes, but his body had no reaction. Strange? No reaction? Chris was about to shake the potion of sublimation. Thud 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 ah. His heart suddenly accelerated, 
and a pain as if his internal organs were being torn apart came from within his body. Chris instantly fell to the ground in pain, and the potion of sublimation fell to the ground, spilling out a lot of potion. When the potion touched the grass, the wild grass instantly decayed and withered. Seeing this scene, Chris's heart sank to the bottom. Could it be that even the wild grass was affected like this, would the potion he drank corrode all his internal organs? Chief Chris, the werewolves saw their leader writhing in pain on the ground and anxiously surrounded him. They were well aware that the reason why the Bone Crusher tribe could achieve such a high status in the Shimo clan was because of their leader, Chris. If Chief Chris was gone, the Bone Crusher tribe would definitely not be able to maintain this position. It might even plummet. What's happening? Just preparing to take the women to see King Shimu's Enowen and Sylvia, they rushed over upon hearing the commotion. If you look closely, you can see that out of the original 15 women, only 5 remained. Just congratulated Chris, is he about to be done for? The bear goblin Bada stepped forward to check. The monster leaders were eager for something to happen to Chris, so they could rise in status. Although monsters wouldn't stab each other in the back, they didn't hold back on cursing each other in their hearts. Click immediately after, only Chris on the ground made a crisp sound of bones cracking. Slowly standing up, his originally two, three meter tall body shot up to an astonishing two, five meters. The mane behind his head became more lush, the gray yellow fur turned into a deep green color, and even his pupils changed. Done for? I'm feeling great, Chris here. Chris, who had come to his senses, covered his head and laughed heartily. At that moment, he felt like he couldn't exhaust the strength in his whole body. It was just too exhilarating. Never felt this good before. The feeling of gaining powerful strength turned out to be like this. If a small elevation potion could do this, how would the bloodline bestowed by King Shimu be like? Chris couldn't wait to try it out. Boring seeing that Chris was fine, Anawan and Sylvia quickly left with the women to find King Red Dragon. Having just gone through their test, some women were not suitable to be the king's women, and there would definitely be thoughts of betrayal. After the selection process, only these five women remained. Inside the dragon's lair, the dragon's ears could hear everything outside clearly. It seemed that Chris had already taken the elevation potion, and his strength should have grown significantly. If all the monsters of the Shimu clan could take the elevation potion, their overall strength would surely increase greatly. Unfortunately, in this human town, only one bottle of elevation potion was found. The only downside of the elevation potion was that each person could only use it once, as everyone's potential would be exhausted once used. To continue growing, one had to enhance their own bloodline. Your Majesty just then, Sylvia and Enowen entered with the remaining five human women. Great. Great King Shimu. The five women behind them were so frightened by the dragon that they trembled. They hurriedly lowered their heads and dared not look at King Shimu. Before meeting King Shimu, Sylvia and Enowen had prepared them well. Not being scared to the point of sitting paralyzed on the ground was already considered good. I remember there were 15? King Shimu was very clear that his memory was not wrong. That's right, King Shimu. Sylvia stepped forward to explain to King Shimu. The other women, either unwilling or having their loved ones killed by the monsters, harbored hatred in their hearts. Since keeping them would only cause trouble, it was better to kill them. The previous Sylvia would never have done this, but after following King Shimu, she understood many things. The first was to eliminate all threats at the root. Regardless of whether these weak human women could threaten the dragon in the future, as long as they showed hatred towards the dragon now, they had no future. And these five women, who were orphans and had been captured to be sold as slaves, had no sense of belonging to the human town. Even harboring hatred, when they heard that becoming the dragon's companion would allow them to live, they naturally agreed. It was much better than being sold as slaves. After listening to Sylvia's explanation, King Shimu looked at her with great satisfaction. Seeing Sylvia change, he was very happy. Some of the remaining tasks you know what to do, your majesty, my sister Sylvia and I will take our leave for now. Enowen squeezed Sylvia's hand. The two bid farewell to Shimu in turn, leaving five women in front of Shimu. Without Sylvia, they became even more nervous and fearful. What are your names? Eventually, Shimu broke the tense atmosphere. Sila, Beth. The women each answered with their names. After learning their names, Shimu was ready to proceed formally. Do not doubt the dragon's ability in this regard. There are so many dragon species in the continent for a reason. Time passed slowly. After another six months, Enowen's belly finally grew larger, making it impossible for her to jump around like before. She had to pay constant attention to the child in her belly. The most common thing she did was train swordsmanship with Gwen Doran. Because Gwen Doran was a mage, learning swordsmanship was purely for self-defense, so Enowen taught her the light curtain style. A style focused on defense. 
Their philosophy was the opposite of the shepherd style, believing that defense is the best offense, waiting for the enemy to show weakness from exhaustion before attacking. Although Enowen didn't know much about the light curtain style, she found a book on this style in a human town. She followed the instructions and taught Gwen Doran. Whether Gwen Doran could improve her swordsmanship further would depend on her own talent. During this six months, three people became pregnant. Shimu looked at their talents and felt slightly disappointed. Bloodline, human dragon bloodline, talent, a strong physique, be singing wanderer. Bloodline, human dragon bloodline, talent, a iron body. Bloodline, human dragon bloodline, talent, a strong and agile body, Shimu had enough reason to suspect that if it weren't for his own red dragon bloodline, the children would have had much lower potential due to their bloodline. These children would probably struggle to even reach a B-level talent. Looking at them, the common feature among the three children's talents was their physical attributes. This was thanks to Shimu's own red dragon bloodline that they inherited. Shimu chose not to spend gold coins to refresh the talents of these three children. He had tried before and wasted nearly 3,000 gold coins. He found that even with the help of gold coins, it was difficult to get good talents if the partner's talents were not high enough. They always hovered around A-level talents, never reaching S-level talents. Fortunately, with the template for offspring growth, even small mosquitoes have meat. With the Red Dragon bloodline, these three children would undoubtedly become excellent warriors of the Shimu clan in the future, much stronger than most monsters. As long as there were enough children, everyone's data strength would be added to his own, which would be useful in the end. In addition, in this six months, the Shimu clan did not have any major actions. Besides expanding their population, the monsters mostly went outside the Dokafa mountains to hunt. They caught some delicious and fun wild beasts to provide to Princess Gwen Doran, pleasing her. It is worth mentioning that Gwen Doran, who had an S-level talent in magic affinity, had become a mid-level mage before she even turned one. She was just a step away from surpassing her mother, a high-level mage. However, the further one progresses, the harder it is to master and comprehend magic, so Gwen Doran's progress slowed down. At the same time, the news of the destruction of the human town eventually reached the ears of the Red Kingdom. Upon learning that it was the monsters who destroyed the human town, their first reaction was not to seek revenge against the monsters. Instead, they sent an emissary to the Dokafa Mountains. West Shepherd did not choose to appear in person, but instead sent Chris to meet the emissary of the Red Kingdom. Later, it was revealed by Chris that the Red Kingdom had come to apologize? They hoped to rebuild a human town and requested that Chris and the monsters refrain from causing trouble. They were willing to offer Chris a thousand gold coins and various food and minerals annually in exchange for peace and tranquility. This left West Shepherd somewhat stunned. They destroyed your town, killed your people, and took your belongings, and now they not only did not seek revenge, but also apologized to me for peace? The envoy from the Yar Kingdom was unaware that there was a dragon behind Chris. West Shepherd remained vigilant, believing that the humans were weak. He, being a former human himself, understood that they must be plotting something bigger. He had considered sending a forest giant eagle to monitor how the humans were rebuilding the town. However, considering the size of the forest giant eagle and the vigilance of humans, he abandoned this plan and instead sent the night elves birds to monitor. The birds were small in size, resembling ordinary birds, lacking great intelligence, but capable of monitoring human activities. If the humans made any moves, they could quickly inform West Shepherd. West Shepherd then sent the forest giant eagle to investigate. Daddy! I'm back! Just as West Shepherd was contemplating the future, Gwendolyn ran up to him. Gwendolyn's cute little face was covered in sweat, holding a wooden sword suitable for her use in one hand. Gwendolyn's training never stopped. She practiced magic one day and swordsmanship the next, excelling in both due to her talent. Besides being a mid-level mage, she was also a low-level light curtain swordsman. Due to her lineage with the Red Dragon, Gwendolyn was much taller than her peers. Who has seen a one-and-a-half-year-old girl develop like a three- or four-year-old child? How was your training today? West Shepherd asked. I gained many insights in swordsmanship today. Aunt Enevan has always praised me as a genius Gwendolyn threw away the wooden sword in her hand, hands on her hips, proudly saying. As a low-level swordsman, she could hold her own against some ordinary monsters in battle. It wasn't that the monsters were letting Princess Gwendolyn win, but rather their strength was no match for her. West Shepherd had considered teaching the monsters human swordsmanship, but failed. Few monsters could learn swordsmanship, with only three in the entire West Shepherd clan having some knowledge. Even Chris, a highly potential jackal man, had not learned it. The world was fair, while monsters were given powerful bodies, they naturally could not learn the swordsmanship that humans could use to become stronger. You did well, Gwendolyn, but remember, do not be too arrogant. Even though your talent is indeed strong, 
there will always be someone who can surpass you. West Shepherd was well aware of the potential of the child Enovan was carrying. Perhaps in terms of magic, Enovan's child and Gwendolyn were not equals, but in swordsmanship, the child would definitely surpass Gwendolyn. The double S-ranked combat talent was no joke. Oh I know, daddy, Gwendolyn pouted. Every time dad praises himself, he always has to make fun of himself again. How come she hasn't seen anyone who can surpass herself? Even mom Sylvia said that even in her former kingdom of Alara, she was considered a top talent. Don't wait until you suffer losses to understand. Westmarch said impatiently. He could tell that Gwendolyn wasn't listening. Now, they just had to wait for Enowen's child to be born, and when that happened, Gwendolyn would understand the meaning of his words. I suddenly remembered something. Dad, I still have to go exchange swords with Aunt Enowen, so I'll go first. Gwendolyn didn't want to listen to her dad's lectures anymore. Making up an excuse, she picked up a wooden sword and ran off. The proud and domineering nature of the red dragon bloodline began to show in Gwendolyn. It was very fitting for a red dragon's temperament. Perhaps it wasn't Sylvia's gentle genes that were suppressing Gwendolyn, she probably couldn't even imitate her appearance. Little Gwendolyn I'm sorry, your majesty, as you know, she hasn't faced any setbacks since she grew up. Sylvia happened to walk into the dragon's lair. She overheard the conversation between the father and daughter, watching Gwendolyn run off. I understand this very well. Let her go, she will understand one day. You've worked hard, Sylvia. Westmarch said. This is what I should do, your majesty. Sylvia blushed and touched her head shyly. Outside the lair, what Sylvia might not have expected was that Gwendolyn didn't go to find anyone this time, but went to find the Knoll Chris. Chris, in the Bone Crusher tribe. Chris was about to discuss today's plans with his wolf cubs when he heard Gwendolyn's shout. Hmm, it's Princess Gwendolyn. Chris immediately smiled obsequiously. Are you going hunting? Gwendolyn asked. Yes, Princess Gwendolyn, we are leaving the Dakafa Mountains under cover of night to hunt outside, and we'll be back after daybreak tomorrow. Chris nodded. Monsters prefer to hunt at night. So Chris decided to wait until nightfall to act. Alright, this time, take me with you on the hunting mission. Gwendolyn's pure blue eyes turned gently, thinking of a good plan. She had never left the dragon's lair since she was a child. She had never fought with enemies outside, and she wanted to test her strength. Wah! What? No, 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 Princess Gwendolyn, leave this to us wild dogs. How can you come along? Chris waved his hands anxiously. This was something they monsters should do, and having Princess Gwendolyn come along would disrupt the order and lower her status. As a loyal wild dog to the king, he could never agree to Princess Gwendolyn's request. Why? Didn't you say you would do anything for me? Gwendolyn pouted with a huff. She looked adorable. That's true, your highness, but there are many rules to follow, and this is something I can't agree to unless. Unless what? Unless you can get the king's approval. If the king agrees to let you come hunting with us, then I can take you. Chris truly respected and admired Gwendolyn, but he wouldn't forget that his true loyalty was to King Westmarch. Without the king's consent, he could never just obey Gwendolyn. I need dad's approval too? No, no, this can't let dad know. Gwendolyn wanted to surprise her dad and show him what she could do. If you tell dad, it will be meaningless. I'm sorry, your highness Gwendolyn, I cannot agree. Chris shrugged, he had principles. Let Gwendolyn go. Suddenly, Sylvia walked over. Mother Sylvia? Gwendolyn and Chris were both shocked. They wondered why Sylvia agreed. No. Even if it's Mother Sylvia, I still can't do it without His Majesty's command, Chris stubbornly shook his head. The king's command is above all. As a mother, don't I have this right? I am the king's companion. Sylvia pretended to be angry, took a step forward, turned her back to Gwendolyn, and blinked at Chris. It meant that the king knew, and he asked me to come out and tell you. Smart Chris instantly understood Sylvia's meaning. No wonder there was such a commotion, the king didn't show up, everything was under the king's control. I'm really sorry, Mother Sylvia, it was my disrespect. Your Highness Gwendolyn can go hunting with me, please forgive my disrespect. Chris could bend. Since this matter has the king's command, everything is easy. Without saying a word, he apologized to Sylvia. Mom Gwendolyn looked at Sylvia with a hint of admiration in her eyes. She was indeed a mother, Chris, who didn't listen to her, immediately obeyed when her mother got angry. When will she be able to establish such authority herself? Hmm Gwendolyn, go, remember to have fun Sylvia gently reached out and touched Gwendolyn's head. Oh, mom I'm not going to play, I'm going hunting with Chris to prove to dad. Gwendolyn raised her little hand high, clenched into a small fist. Alright Gwendolyn is the best, go, let his majesty see your skills. Sylvia couldn't help but smile. Silly child, the king sees everything you do. 
Just hope you don't disappoint the king. Chris, bring me my sword and magic wand. Gwendolyn exclaimed. She had never left the dragon's lair before, and now she was like a child about to leave the village for the city. She was so excited. All right, my respected your highness Gwendolyn. Chris promptly brought Gwendolyn's equipment, a high-quality magic wand, and a short sword specially made for her size. If you're going hunting, bring my mount too. It's called Wind Chaser, not afraid of jackals, tigers, or leopards, runs very fast, even if you encounter danger, you can quickly escape. Anamon appeared at some point, with a big belly, she was holding a horse that was all black and purple. This was originally her mount, but unfortunately, she hadn't ridden much since she got pregnant. Instead of letting Wind Chaser rust in the stable, it was better to let Gwendolyn ride it, which could also ensure Gwendolyn's comfort. Yay! Thanks, Aunt Anamon. Now that I have weapons and a mount, am I a knight in your stories? Gwendolyn happily bounced around. Lifted by Enowen, she sat on the saddle of the horse. It must be said that Windchaser was very spirited. When Gwendolyn sat on its back, it showed no signs of panic or restlessness, but behaved very obediently. How can you be called a knight? It's a princess, right? Sylvia corrected. Knights are here to protect princesses, and her daughter is clearly the princess of the Westmarch clan. Then it's a knight princess. The young Gwendolyn seemed not to fully understand the meaning of knights and princesses. Really, say whatever you want, just remember to protect yourself. Sylvia couldn't be bothered to explain the meaning to Dolan. If she said a few more words, Chris and his hunting team wouldn't have to set out. Don't worry, mother, my strength is very powerful. Gwendolyn rolled up her sleeves, showing her slender, fair arms. Who would have thought that hidden beneath this skin was the strength of a lower rank swordsman? Lady Sylvia, I, Chris, will do everything to protect Princess Gwendolyn, please do not worry. Even if I die, not a hair on Princess Gwendolyn's head will be harmed. Chris mounted his wolf, patting his chest, assuring Sylvia. It's better be so. If Dolan gets hurt, even a little, you will be finished, Chris. Before Sylvia, the mother, could speak, Enowen, as the aunt, reminded Chris. Gwendolyn is a treasure of the West Shepherd clan. Haha <laughs> I understand that very well, Lady Enowen. Enough talk, we should go. Chris glanced at the night sky above. If they didn't leave now, they might not be able to leave tonight. Hurry, hurry. I can't wait any longer. Go. Bang the next moment, the wind under Gwendolyn's ride shot out like a poised arrow. Princess Gwendolyn. Chris hurriedly drove his wolf to chase, with the rest of the wolf riders following closely. Dolan. Sylvia called out worriedly. I didn't expect wind to be kept in the stable for half a year and still be so agile. Enowen raised her hand to her eyes, watching Gwendolyn's departure. She felt no tension at all. As a lower-ranked swordsman, Gwendolyn wouldn't fall off her horse and get hurt. You, Enowen, how could you give Dolan such a horse? Sylvia said irritably. Seeing Enowen's unconcerned look, she had no worries at all. Oh, it's fine, Sister Sylvia. Wind is very smart, it won't let Dolan get hurt. Enowen smiled and shrugged. She knew her own mount well. Dragons lair your majesty, as per your orders, Dolan has gone hunting with Chris and the others. Sylvia reported. I knew it was your idea, your majesty, otherwise that Chris wouldn't have opened his mouth. Anawan chuckled. Well, I've considered a lot. Dolan has been staying in the dragon's lair all this time without leaving. This is a good opportunity to let her see the world outside the Dokafa Mountains and gain some practical experience. It's a win-win situation. The West Shepherd shared his thoughts. He wasn't worried about Gwendolyn's safety at all, with Chris and her own strength, there was no creature near the Dokafa Mountains that could threaten them. Your Majesty is right. As a swordsman, it's not enough to just talk on paper. You have to prove it in battle. Enowen pretended to wave at the air. Enowen, Dolan is a mage. Sylvia couldn't help but remind her. It's all the same. Even a mage needs to understand how to use magic after real combat to maximize its power. That night, Sylvia was very sensible and didn't compete with the other sisters for the king. Now they must make those sisters bear the king's children quickly to solidify their position in the West Shepherd clan. After spending half a year together, Sylvia had developed some feelings for these new sisters. Most importantly, she had spent the night with the king last night and needed to recover now. The next morning, except for Enowen, the West Shepherd's companions gathered in Sylvia's tent. Ladies, how do you feel about the Western Mu plan in the past six months? Sylvia sat on a chair, sipping on the hot water prepared in the morning, patiently inquiring. It was time to ask the sisters for their thoughts and opinions after spending half a year in the Western Mu clan. The Western Mu clan is great. His majesty has been very kind to me, and I am also pregnant with his majesty's child. I am very happy. Sira touched her swollen belly, her face showing a look of happiness. They had food and clothing, 
and many monster subordinates to help them, just like princesses in the kingdom. This life was much better than being a prisoner in the dungeon. Without his majesty the red dragon, her future was obvious. I also like the atmosphere in the western Mu clan. When I was in the human world before, people always talked about how scary and fierce monsters were. Now, I think dealing with unpredictable human hearts is much better. Bath was also pregnant. Her identity was a bit more special than the others, as she was originally a noblewoman in the city. When she went out with friends for a meal, she was betrayed and sold to slave traders by a jealous friend who envied her beauty. After going through twists and turns, she ended up in this remote human town ready to be sold. Fortunately, the monsters saved her. The thoughts of the other three women were exactly the same as Beth's. They all enjoyed their current life. Even if given the choice again, they would not hesitate to choose to stay here. They could see that His Majesty cared for them sincerely and would never treat them as tools for his own pleasure. Your words make me very satisfied. I hope you truly mean what you say, do not disappoint His Majesty's love for you. Beth, now that you are pregnant, focus on taking care of yourself. For those of you who are not pregnant, continue to work hard. Do not be anxious. Even if you are not pregnant, His Majesty will not treat you differently. While offering advice to Beth and the others, Sylvia also comforted the two women who were not pregnant. After giving birth to Gwendolyn, she had been with His Majesty for a long time but had not conceived again. The chances of a dragon breeding offspring were naturally lower than other races, but the Western Mu clan had been quite fortunate. All right, Sister Sylvia, thank you. Martha and Elise expressed their gratitude. In reality, they were all feeling extremely anxious, despite knowing that His Majesty treated them well. They were still unable to conceive offspring for him, which made them somewhat nervous. They worried that without children of their own, they might be abandoned by His Majesty, just like the wives of kings and the rumors who were forgotten for not bearing children. No need to thank me. In a clan, we are all companions of His Majesty, sisters. There is no need for thanks between sisters. Sylvia chuckled. At that moment, there was a commotion outside. Princess Gwendolyn is back. Little Gwendolyn is back? Sylvia's face lit up with joy upon hearing the news. Gwendolyn is back sister Sylvia, you should go see her quickly. Beth reminded her. All right, then I won't be accompanying you all anymore. Sylvia couldn't care less about the group of sisters as she happily ran out of the tent to meet her daughter Gwendolyn. Ah, if only I could bear such powerful offspring for his majesty. Yes, but I know my own talents. It's probably not possible. Don't dwell on it. As long as it's offspring, his majesty will surely be happy. When will I be able to get pregnant outside, mom? Gwendolyn rode in on the wind to Sylvia. Looking closely, there were many beast heads and bodies tied to the back of the horse. It seems that this time Gwendolyn had a good harvest while hunting. Before Sylvia could even reach out to hug Gwendolyn, she had already agilely leaped down from the saddle. Be careful, Sylvia worriedly said. It's okay, mom. From this height, I won't get hurt from jumping down. By the way, where is dad? I want to show him my trophies. Gwendolyn pointed to the wild beast head tied to the back of the horse, a bloody and ferocious sight. As a child, Gwendolyn showed no fear, only excitement. Truly a child with the bloodline of a red dragon. His majesty is still resting, so don't disturb him, Sylvia reminded as she squatted down. Okay then, I'll show dad when he wakes up. I'll go to sleep now, mom. I haven't slept all night and I'm a bit tired. Of course, you can. Sylvia led Gwendolyn towards the tent, holding her hand. Mom, if dad wakes up while I'm sleeping, you must tell me right away. Okay. You must. All right, how many times do you have to say it? Would mom lie to you? After comforting Gwendolyn and seeing her fall asleep, Sylvia left the tent. Chris, you did well. You protected Gwendolyn very well. Sylvia praised. No, Lady Sylvia, everything was done by Princess Gwendolyn's own strength. Chris roughly recounted Gwendolyn's hunting achievements to Sylvia. Every time they found prey, Gwendolyn would rush forward first, and before Chris could act, the beast would already be killed by Gwendolyn. There was a moment when a beast moved in the bushes, scaring Gwendolyn into casting a second-tier lightning magic, knocking down a row of trees. It turned out to be a little rabbit hiding in the grass. She's still just a child, Sylvia said with a wry smile. Finally, she saw a childlike side of Gwendolyn. Soon, under the scorching sun at noon, Westmeyer woke up. I'm getting sleepier, indeed about to enter adulthood. I must handle everything before falling asleep. A pair of crimson vertical pupils lit up in the dark dragon's lair. Dad. Look, am I amazing? Gwendolyn ordered the gnoll men to bring down all the trophies from the horse and displayed them in front of Westmeyer one by one. They were all formidable beasts commonly found in the wild, like black bears and lizards. Truly my little Gwendolyn, very impressive, Westmeyer lightly praised. 
This time, he didn't lecture Gwendolyn, just kept praising her. Sometimes, a few words of advice to children are enough, but more importantly, encouragement and praise, so that children can gain confidence in their growth process. Hearing her father's praise, Gwendolyn shyly rubbed her head and her tail swayed proudly. Then she remembered something and quickly said, Oh, Dad, I have to apologize to you apologize? Westmeyer was puzzled. Yes, Dad, I went hunting with Chris and the others without your consent this time. It was my fault, don't blame Chris and them. I forced Chris to take me hunting. Gwendolyn did not mention Sylvia or shift the blame to Chris. Instead, she took all the blame upon herself. Hearing Gwendolyn's words, Sylvia and Westmeyer smiled at each other. See, Gwendolyn is very sensible after all. Both sides tacitly agreed not to tell Gwendolyn the truth. Little Gwendolyn, this time I forgive you, but next time this kind of thing cannot happen again, understand? Everything must be discussed with me, West Shepherd said with a show of authority. A faint dragons might emanated from him, making Gwendolyn feel immense pressure and think to herself, is this the aura and power of a father? It's really amazing, just this pressure alone is enough to make me unable to stand up straight. I understand, dad, Gwendolyn said. Good, go rest now. I heard from Chris that you hunted all night, and you've only rested for four hours until now. Rest more to recover your strength and become stronger. West Shepherd urged with concern. Oh okay, dad, speaking of which, I'm feeling a bit sleepy again, hee hee I'll go to sleep first. Gwendolyn rubbed her tired eyes and obediently waved her hand. She then briskly ran out of the dragon's lair. After Gwendolyn left, West Shepherd turned to Chris and said, Tell me, Chris, did you discover anything during this hunt? Praise your greatness, Lord West Shepherd, your wise eyes saw through the thoughts of this humble wild dog of mine at a glance, making me wish to open my chest and offer you my blood-stained heart. Chris pretended to cover his chest, as if about to tear open his chest cavity. But he wasn't foolish enough to actually do it. Very well, Chris, open up and show me your heart. West Shepherd's lips curled slightly. Um, your majesty, I did indeed consider doing that, but I would rather do more for you before I die. Chris hesitated for a moment, then chuckled. This time, why wasn't the Red Dragon Lord following the usual routine? It made him feel a bit awkward. Enough, no need to say more, Chris. What happened in the end? West Shepherd said impatiently. Chris felt like kicking him. Well, during this hunting operation, everything was normal at first, but we encountered some danger later on, almost getting us buried there. Chris recounted the incident, still feeling a bit shaken. It was normal for Princess Gwendolyn to be unaware of the danger, but as the leader of the Jackal people, Chris understood how dangerous it was. Go on. Quickly, Chris recounted in detail what happened during the hunt last night to West Shepherd. It turned out that last night, their hunting team encountered a group of scorpion-tailed lions. Scorpion-tailed lions were large chaotic evil monsters. Among monsters, they were considered huge, with a body length of 5 meters, rumored to have dragon bloodline, hence possessing a pair of dragon wings for flying in the sky. This group of scorpion-tailed lions consisted of 20 individuals. Despite Chris leading a hunting team of over a hundred jackal people, they were completely outmatched by these 20 scorpion-tailed lions. Not to mention their ability to fly, their strength alone could crush the jackal people. Even with Chris's enhanced abilities, he could only handle one or two, what about the rest? The scorpion-tailed lions in the sky naturally noticed their presence. They descended from the sky to block their path. Chris noticed that the attention of the scorpion-tailed lions was all on Princess Gwendolyn. He immediately realized that these lions' favorite taste was human flesh. He knew instantly that they had their eyes on Princess Gwendolyn. Chris promptly led the jackal people to stand in front of the scorpion-tailed lions, mentally prepared for sacrifice. However, the scorpion-tailed lions only glanced at Princess Gwendolyn, their eyes filled with panic, and they flew away in a hurry. Chris was puzzled, but the only thing he knew was that their lives were spared. So, he quickly abandoned the hunting plan and returned with Princess Gwendolyn to the dragon's lair. Your Majesty, that's the situation. The only thing that puzzles me is why those scorpion-tailed lions ran away at the mere sight of Princess Gwendolyn, Chris said in confusion. Princess Gwendolyn has the bloodline of my red dragon, and being around her for so long, she carries a faint scent of the red dragon. These scorpion-tailed lions are naturally afraid of dragons. After catching a whiff of the dragon scent on Princess Gwendolyn, they naturally panicked and left. West would guess the reason why the lions left in a hurry. Scorpion-tailed lions are not very intelligent, but they can speak a common language and have some wisdom. Perhaps due to their dragon bloodline, they are more afraid of dragons than other creatures. They instinctively avoid dragons in any situation. Where dragons have appeared, wild scorpion-tailed lions are rarely found, unless they have joined a dragon clan. The lions must have smelled their own scent on Princess Gwendolyn and fled in fear. 
Indeed, your majesty, just with her scent, Princess Gwendolyn managed to scare off those lions, Chris chuckled. In the end, it was Princess Gwendolyn's scent that saved Chris and the others. How did Princess Gwendolyn react to the lions? Westwood asked with narrowed eyes. Princess Gwendolyn remained calm, showing no signs of panic. However, she is smart and did not provoke the lions, Chris replied. From Gwendolyn's perspective, the lions were just slightly larger ordinary beasts. Therefore, she did not mention anything about the scorpion-tailed lions in her conversation with Westwood. Scorpion-tailed lions. Westwood pondered silently. Generally, scorpion-tailed lions are unlikely to appear in these mountains due to their size and the amount of food they require. The food resources in the forest near the Dokafa Mountains are abundant, which is why Chris and his group often go hunting there. However, sustaining such a large group of scorpion-tailed lions is troublesome. Additionally, scorpion-tailed lions tend to cooperate with other evil creatures for hunting. The evil creatures in the vicinity are mostly under Westwood's control. Great Majesty, those scorpion-tailed lions could pose a threat in the future. Should I lead the Bone Crusher tribe to eliminate them? The werewolves of the Bone Crusher tribe now number over 200. Chris believed that with his tribe and some help from the forest giant eagles, they could defeat the lions. Although casualties might be high, Chris was willing to risk it at the king's command. No need. When the scorpion-tailed lions caught the scent of a dragon on Princess Gwendolyn and fled, they flew off to who knows where, Westwood shook his head. For creatures like the scorpion-tailed lions, who fear dragons greatly, upon learning of the presence of a true dragon nearby, they would swiftly flee the land and continue to do so. This is the nature of scorpion-tailed lions. Many dragons have not been able to subdue them as they tend to flee on their own accord. It's a pity. If they had stayed, I would have shown them the might of the Bone Crusher tribe and the consequences of threatening Princess Gwendolyn's safety. Chris expressed regret. He truly wanted to eliminate the scorpion-tailed lions to avoid constantly being on guard during hunts. There is something I must tell you, Chris. I am about to enter the hibernation period of the dragon, Westwood said. Really? Your Majesty. Chris heard this and suddenly became excited. Your Majesty is now a young dragon, and after waking up from hibernation, won't you become an adult dragon? After becoming an adult dragon, he could receive the blessing of Your Majesty's bloodline sublimation, thereby achieving true evolution and breaking through the 35-year lifespan limit of the jackal people. This way, he could stay by Your Majesty's side for a longer time. Whom? Among the West Shepherd clan, the only monster that West Shepherd could trust was Chris. Only he could handle everything in an orderly manner while he was hibernating. The other monsters were a bit stupid. It seems that in the future, when looking for monster companions, he must recruit some monsters with proud intelligence. Dark elves are not considered monsters, they consider themselves to have the same life wisdom as humans, not as savage as monsters. Should I tell the main mother about this? Chris asked respectfully, suppressing his joy. If you think you know about this, do you think I wouldn't tell them? West Shepherd said impatiently, raising an eyebrow. Naturally, the first to be informed was Sylvia and the others. Things that even the bed partner doesn't know. How could a monster like you know? Yes, yes, I'm just too stupid. Your Majesty, please forgive my ignorance. Chris smiled awkwardly. How could his brain not have turned just now? After the incident with the scorpion-tailed lion, the West Shepherd clan continued to develop quietly. In the blink of an eye, half a year had passed. Gwendolyn turned one year old and celebrated her first birthday. On this day, the monsters of the West Shepherd clan sang and danced, each showing off their skills, hoping to please the little princess. West Shepherd watched the monsters' performances and never expected that each of them had their own unique skills. How did he not know this before? Gwendolyn was very happy on her birthday. It was not only a festival for the monsters, but also many ants gave her gifts. It must be said that the five human companions that West Shepherd later acquired were skilled in handcrafts. When they learned about Gwendolyn's upcoming birthday a month ago, they personally knitted gifts for her. At the same time, about half a month later, Sila, Beth, and Julie also gave birth. Name, Valentin Sira, birthday, January 2, 1989, on the Watlin continent, bloodline, human dragon bloodline, talent, a powerful physique, be singing wanderer, overall aptitude, a dash, introduction, the red dragon bloodline saved your talents and ignorance. Name, Stanny Beth, birthday, January 5, 1989, on the Watlin continent, bloodline, human dragon bloodline, talent, iron body, overall aptitude, a dash, introduction, the red dragon bloodline enhances your aptitude. Name, Heidi Julie, birthday, January 10, 1989, on the Watlin continent, bloodline, human dragon bloodline, talent, a strong and agile body, overall aptitude, a, introduction, you will be a more outstanding warrior. These are the data of the three children of the West Shepherd. 
There are two sons and one daughter. The daughter's talent is slightly stronger than the son's, probably due to talent A. From their data, it is highly likely that they have no affinity with magicians and other professions, so they can honestly train in swordsmanship and become a melee warrior. Ding! Detected a common talent among the owner's offspring, now starting fusion. Congratulations on acquiring the S. Savage body talent. West Shepherd Raymond Gattuso Caesar, daughters, two, sons, two, shared talent with children, S. Savage body. New. Be agile, new. Be singing wanderer, new. Item, indomitable crown, growth grade, introduction, with your dual S talents, facing ordinary dragons of the same age, you will be able to take on three at once. The previous Western Shepherd was only slightly stronger than the same aged red dragon, but now with the addition of his daughter's talent, the Western Shepherd can easily handle three ordinary red dragons of the same age. And this is still based on data before his children have grown up. When his children grow up and share all aspects of their data, he can easily handle ten of them. Katrina, you're doomed. It's safe to say that the first target of revenge in the Western Shepherd's mind is Katrina. Furthermore, the Western Shepherd discovered that only when he has the first offspring of a race can he receive divine level rewards. Does this mean he should try to find a partner of a different race? Find a partner of a different race to have children. The Western Shepherd is thinking about one thing, besides human races, there isn't much difference, the problem lies with other races, like elves. Are dark elves and wood elves considered different races? Although both are fundamentally elves, they have been separated for so long, can they still be considered one race? Shaking his massive dragon beast, the western shepherd no longer thinks about such things. Whatever, he can just marry a wood elf in the future, even if they are of the same race, he won't lose out. Outside the dragon's lair wow are these the little brothers and sisters? So cute Gwendolyn stood in front of three ants, looking at the babies in their arms. The younger siblings with red dragon blood, just like Gwendolyn, don't have wrinkled faces when they are born, they look very smooth. Although not as clever as Gwendolyn, after many days of learning, they can already say a few words. The Western Shepherd believes that the strength of talent will also affect this. Yes little Doran, I'll rely on you to take care of your younger siblings in the future and protect their safety. Sela said gently. Sister Valentin clutched his mother Sela's skirt, a little scared facing Gwendolyn, only showing half of his face. Unlike Gwendolyn, Valentin's dragon features are not as prominent, if you look closely, you will only see one or two red dragon scales on his hands. He hasn't grown dragon horns and a tail. It seems they have inherited fewer genes from the Western Shepherd, most of them have inherited their mother's bloodline. This is also the reason why they did not give birth to S-level talents. Hmm, sister, I'm listening, don't worry, no matter what happens in the future, just call out my name, and I will come to help you. Seeing that she also has younger siblings now, Gwendolyn couldn't be happier. The other two younger siblings are too timid to talk to her, they are just too scared. They dare to meet their father, why are they afraid to meet their sister? Ever since she felt that dragon power from the Western Shepherd, Gwendolyn has found her father to be formidable and scary, so if she doesn't have anything important, she doesn't dare to bother him. Alright, little Doran, don't disturb your younger siblings, go practice today's magic, don't forget, you swore to become a top magician like your mother before you turned to Sylvia walked over at this time, patting Gwendolyn's head. She signaled Gwendolyn to go to the training ground and not to disturb her younger siblings. I'm becoming a top magician, that's all, I'm only one year old now, I still have a year to go, no rush, the important thing now is these younger siblings. Gwendolyn chuckled confidently, hands on hips, chest out, head held high. Just one year old, she was already a middle level magician. Becoming a high level magician was just a matter of course, right? You, this girl, everything is good about you, except for being too arrogant, really. Sylvia was about to say that she had truly received the true teachings of the Red Dragon. Then she suddenly realized the identity of the queen and had to stop halfway through her words. Inheriting talent, Gwendolyn was also the child who inherited the most of the Western Red Dragon bloodline personality traits so far. Look at her brothers and sisters, where did they inherit the Western traits? Each one hiding behind their mother in fear, completely unable to see them as dragon offspring. Sister Sylvia, don't talk about little Gwendolyn, we believe that little Gwendolyn can do it. Gwendolyn's talent was seen by her three aunts, including Beth. If their children could have such talent, what's wrong with being proud and arrogant? Mom, look, Auntie understands me, you are clearly my mother, how can you belittle your own daughter? Gwendolyn was delighted to hear her aunt's words. These were her true elders. Her current mother was just too verbose, always lecturing her, which would undermine the confidence of a child. Gwendolyn Sylvia's eyes became somewhat terrifying. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, Mom, I'll go practice magic right away. Despite Gwendolyn's carefree attitude, if she saw her mother Sylvia angry, 
she would definitely be the first to be afraid and tighten her neck. Who dares to easily provoke angry parents? Seeing Gwendolyn running away in a hurry, everyone smiled at each other. On the other side, Damar fell in front of Chris. Damar, I have a question for you. Chris asked. Go ahead, Chief Chris. Damar groomed his feathers. Have your forest eagles noticed any movement or presence of scorpion tail lions around the Dokafa Mountains in the past six months? After discovering the forest eagles half a year ago, Westwood gave Chris a task. Let the forest eagles pay close attention to the movements of the scorpion tail lions. Westwood had long suspected that this group of scorpion tailed lions were likely outsiders. No, our forest eagles roam around the Dokafa Mountains every day on time, and have never seen any group of scorpion tailed lions, not even a single hare. Damar shook his head. Even if there was any discovery, he would definitely be the first to inform Queen Westwood. He wouldn't have to wait for Chris to ask. Is that so? All right, go about your business, but remember, if you find a group of scorpion tailed lions during patrol, the first thing to do is to inform Queen Westwood. Chris reminded. You can rest assured on this, Chief Chris. After a brief conversation with Chris, Damar flew away. He began his patrol. Chris stood on the ground watching Damar fly away. Damn it, if our jackal people could fly too, that would be great. When the great creator created us jackal people, couldn't he have added an extra pair of wings? Chris mercilessly criticized the creator. Anyway, the creator couldn't hear him, so he wasn't afraid at all. Without mentioning the name of any deity, the deity wouldn't know which lower being had cursed him. After sighing, Chris turned and returned to his territory for the Broken Bone tribe to rest. The resting territories between each racial tribe were clearly delineated, with the Broken Bone tribe having the largest territory. This was because the Broken Bone tribe made the most contributions and had strong power. Chris was still the most obedient and useful wild dog to Westwood, so naturally he received better treatment. How is the construction going? Everything is going smoothly, Queen Enowen. With the help of the monsters, progress is very smooth. All for His Majesty Shimu, for the Great Shimu Clan. At this moment, the Dark Elves were holding blueprints, directing the monsters and their own people to set up a huge wall near the dragon's lair. The wall was covered with rows of spikes to prevent anyone from climbing over. The Shimu Clan temporarily settled in the Dokafa Mountains and would not move. So the Dark Elves of the Dark Moon tribe took the initiative to propose building walls and various tools to block invasions near the dragon's lair. When this idea reached Shimu's ears, he agreed without hesitation. After all, there was no shortage of wood resources in the Dokafa Mountains, so they could build as they pleased, and it would look nice when enclosed. In the worst-case scenario, even if enemies attacked, they wouldn't have to worry about attacks coming from all directions. Enowen, pregnant with a big belly, personally supervised the construction of the wall. Any deficiencies would be pointed out by her. In half a year, Enowen's child would be born. She was currently the longest pregnant mother in the Shimu clan. Enowen felt helpless, as her sisters who came half a year later had already given birth, leaving her the only one still pregnant. Lady Enowen. Chris suddenly ran over at this moment. What's happening? Why the rush? Enowen put down the blueprints and asked curiously. The humans are here, Chris reminded. Humans? Are they here to deliver something again? The Shimu clan's equipment could be upgraded thanks to the resources brought by those humans. Without looting and the resources voluntarily provided by humans, not everyone in the Shimu clan could update their equipment. Yes, but, this time they brought more guards, I feel something is amiss. I want to ask Lady Enowen to explain the situation to His Majesty Shimu. I'll go delay the humans first and see what's going on. Chris expressed his thoughts. The humans had already arrived near the dragon's lair. As the apparent owner of the Dokafa Mountains, he naturally had to meet with the humans properly. No problem, you go ahead. Enowen nodded as she put away the blueprints. Outside the dragon's lair, to make it look real, Chris deliberately led the hyena people of the Shattered Bone Tribe to establish a real hyena people's lair in this area. It was specifically built to deceive the humans. Chief Chris, we meet again. In this hyena people's lair. As soon as Chris entered, the leader of the humans greeted him with a smile. Ted? Is that your name? Chris sat in his seat, crossed his legs, and assumed a dominant posture. It had been a year since he last met Ted. I'm very grateful, Chief Chris, for remembering my name after a year. Ted smiled. His guards had already surrendered all their weapons to the hyena people. This was the rule for entering the Dokafa Mountains. My memory isn't that bad either, Ted. Judging from your appearance, besides delivering resources this time, is there something else? Chris raised an eyebrow, getting to the point. He didn't want to talk too much with the humans in front of him. Chief Chris is indeed smart. Chief Chris, 
Have you noticed that the resources sent by our Alara Kingdom this year are much richer than the previous year Ted flattered? A human showing such a demeanor to monsters who destroyed his own town would shock anyone who saw it. Chris was no exception, and his intelligence immediately led him to some conclusions. Ted, do you have something to ask of me? Chris quickly asked. Looking at the human in front of him, he felt a bit sinister. If it weren't for considering that the other party was from the kingdom of Yar, he probably couldn't help but want to eat the other party on the spot. In fact, this can be considered a trade, Chief Chris. Recently, our town of Jakarta in the kingdom of Yar has been harassed by a group of scorpion-tailed lions. Ted had just started speaking when Chris's originally bored eye suddenly flashed with a gleam, and then he sat up straight. What did you say? Scorpion-tailed lions? That's right. Seeing Chief Chris so excited, have you perhaps encountered that group of scorpion-tailed lions? Ted speculated upon seeing Chris so excited. Both sides were astute individuals, and if they revealed a little flaw, it was easy for the other party to guess something. That's right, I have indeed seen that group of scorpion-tailed lions. But what I don't quite understand is, don't you humans have crossbows? Once those things are enchanted, it should be no problem to take down a scorpion-tailed lion with one arrow. Chris admitted openly. There was no need to hide this from the human in front of him. At the same time, he raised a question. In human settlements, as long as they were at the town level, they basically had something called a crossbow. Once enchanted, the power of the arrow shot out was immense, even an underage dragon hit by one would risk falling. Crossbows were specifically created by humans to deal with flying monsters in the sky. Chris knew about these crossbows, but the Western Shepherd clan did not make them. Because the Western Shepherd clan lacked enchanters, and the drawbacks of crossbows were that they were difficult to move once set up, with high limitations. So the Western Shepherd clan had no intention of having the clan make crossbows. At least they would wait until the Western Shepherd clan had a few excellent enchanters before making them. Enchanters were not mages, but another type of auxiliary profession. Any weapon could be enchanted by an enchanter to become more powerful. Indeed, it's very simple. But those scorpion-tailed lions are also very clever. They deliberately lie in wait in the wild along the routes where we humans transport trade goods, making it impossible for our crossbows to be of any use. Ted pointed out the trouble they humans faced. Crossbows could only be placed on the walls of towns, while the attacks of the scorpion-tailed lions occurred on the outdoor roads of trade routes. It was impossible to guard against. Do you humans really have no way to deal with the scorpion-tailed lions in the sky? Chris asked. He didn't believe that humans had no means at all. Besides, why should he accept the thankless task of dealing with scorpion-tailed lions? Moreover, he was not the owner of the Makafa Mountains, the true owner was King West Shepherd. Well, the king of the kingdom of Yar has already dispatched flying cavalry to us, but it will take over a month for them to arrive. You can understand the losses involved in this. So I thought of coming to discuss with you, hoping that Chief Chris could use the talons of your forest giant eagles to tear apart those filthy lions in the sky. Ted's words were not just answering Chris's question, but also warning Chris that their flying cavalry would soon arrive at the town of Jakato. Be careful when your forest giant eagles deliberately fly over our heads in the future. Hee <laughs> hee since your flying cavalry is about to arrive, our bonecrusher tribe doesn't need to take action. Besides, with the little you've brought, do you think I would help you deal with the scorpion-tailed lions? Dream on. Chris decisively refused. It was good to have received the news about the scorpion-tailed lions. The rest was not something he could decide. No no no, Chief Chris, you've misunderstood. Of course, it's not just this little thing. We can also make a trade. I know that you, the Jackal Clan, and those monsters, all very much want to feast on our human flesh. Therefore, I can assure you that as long as you help eliminate that group of scorpion-tailed lions, at the end of each month, I will offer more than 10 humans as tribute to your Bonecrusher tribe. Ted was prepared. He knew the Jackal people would not easily agree to fight the scorpion-tailed lions, so he specifically brought out humans that monsters would find hard to refuse. As the most remote human town in the kingdom of Alara, it was a place where many criminals were exiled. Ted could easily grab a few death row inmates to send to Chris. It was no big deal. After all, they would have to be killed later, so might as well make use of them. Or should I say that you humans are the cruelest, that statement is indeed not wrong at all. Chris was shocked by Ted's words. Even as a chaotic and evil monster, he could not throw his own kind to humans as food. Even traitors should be dealt with by their own kind. Let's not worry about how we humans are, Chris, leader of the tribe, just give me a response, whether you are willing to make this deal? Ted didn't want to dwell on this topic. Just make use of some death row inmates. I don't need humans. How about this, you double the resources, and I can agree to your request. 
But let's be clear, I may not be able to kill that group of scorpion-tailed lions. In the end, it all depends on the opinion of King Westmarch. Chris couldn't give a guarantee. Even if King Westmarch disagreed later, these humans wouldn't know if they had actually gone to deal with the scorpion-tailed lions. This was called an empty promise. Agreed. Soon, Ted and Chris reached a cooperation agreement and prepared to leave with their guards. When they reached the door, Ted and his group stopped in their tracks. By the way, Chris, why are you building a wall behind the nest? Shouldn't you be enclosing your own nest? Ted turned back to look. I'll do whatever I want, do you have a problem with that? Chris couldn't think of an excuse, so he didn't bother explaining to Ted. No no no, this is your own business, Chris, I have no objections. Just asking casually, goodbye the doubled resources will be delivered to you in a few days. Ted waved his hand and left with his guards. Seeing that Ted and his group had finally left, Chris hurriedly ran into the dragon's nest to tell King Westmarch about what had happened today. Outside, Lord Ted, why did you agree to the jackal people's conditions? Doubling the resources is a lot of pressure for our town of Jakardo. A guard finally couldn't help but ask. Jakardo was already a remote town that had been ravaged and destroyed by monsters before. Giving the monsters twice the resources would be a further blow to the developing town of Jakardo. It's just a few resources, give it to them. Let the jackal people try their luck against the scorpion-tailed lions. Ted's previously humble attitude turned cold. He was like a different person. But what if they don't go after the scorpion-tailed lions? The guard was worried that Chris and his group would go back on their word, take all the resources, and not do anything. Isn't that playing them? Do you think I haven't thought of that? Rest assured, those jackal people will definitely go. Ted said confidently. Um, Lord Ted, are you really sure about that? The guard felt that monsters were not to be trusted when they spoke, especially chaotic and evil monsters. When they made promises, it was like hot air, sometimes true and sometimes not. The scorpion-tailed lions have been attacking our trade routes, not far from the Dakafa Mountains. They will definitely clash with the jackal people. Just wait, when they are both weakened, it will be our time to send troops to eliminate them and regain our dignity and resources. Ted finally revealed his true thoughts. This is what he wanted to do. Werewolf. Go to hell. Dragon's lair. That's how it is, great King Westwood. Humans come to us to deal with the scorpion lions, Chris reported truthfully. He recounted the entire conversation process, word for word. Those scorpion lions haven't gone far? Westwood was a bit surprised. He thought the scorpion lions would choose to leave after smelling the red dragon's scent. King Westwood, I believe the reason those monsters didn't leave is simple. Think about it, when Princess Gwendolyn and I encountered the scorpion lions while hunting in the wild. Those scorpion lions probably think our territory is there, but what they don't know is that our real territory is in the Dokafa Mountains, Chris ventured to guess. Only this possibility can explain why the scorpion lions appeared there. Otherwise, Chris thought the scorpion lions wouldn't be foolish enough to oppose the dragons. That human said the scorpion lions were lurking near the Dokafa Mountains? The sharp dragon claws struck the rock beneath them, splashing tiny fragments of stone. That's right, your majesty. Do you want to take action against those scorpion lions? Chris's eyes were a bit excited. He had long wanted to avenge himself against those scorpion lions. Not only did they scare him, but they also scared Princess Gwendolyn. They deserved to die. Go and see, within the Westwood clan, there is currently only the forest eagles as a flying unit. Westwood wanted to see if he could subdue the scorpion lions. The forest eagles were useful before, but with further developments, having only the forest eagles would not be enough. Other flying creatures must be recruited. The scorpion lions, powerful creatures, were very suitable. I understand your meaning, great king, please allow me to. No, Chris, this time you stay here and behave yourself. I will personally lead the forest eagles to see those scorpion lions. Westwood interrupted Chris. He knew Chris wanted to follow him, but he refused. The reason was simple, Chris, a werewolf who couldn't fly, would be of no help if he went, but would only slow down his progress. This matter should be accompanied by the forest eagles only. Well, well, well. Okay. Chris lowered his head in disappointment. It was a pity that he couldn't fly and was rejected by the king. Roar. The dragon leaves the nest. Westwood's crimson body, like a small mountain, emerged from the dragon's lair, spreading its wings that reached 25 meters in length, like a cloud covering the sky. It immediately attracted the attention of all the monsters. It's the king. Why did King Westwood come out? Quick. Kneel down and pay respects to the king. Daddy. All the monsters prostrated themselves respectfully on the ground. Westwood's companions and children ran up to greet him. Well, go about your own business, don't mind me. Westwood first spoke to the monsters, then turned his gaze to his offspring and companions. 
Daddy, where are you going? Gwendolyn was the first to jump out curiously and ask. Little Gwendolyn is so smart. Indeed I have something to attend to and will be back soon. Westwood smiled gently. Although he didn't want to belittle his other children, among the current children, Gwendolyn was the smartest and most talented. As for Valentine, Stanny, and Heidi, they were slightly inferior. Daddy is so mean, I asked you where you were going, but you answered me like this. Gwendolyn pouted with her arms crossed. He didn't answer her question at all. Gwendolyn. Sylvia pulled Gwendolyn's clothes a little angrily, indicating that she shouldn't speak to the king like that. It's okay, Sylvia, it's not a secret. I'll tell little Doran about it. Do you remember the group of lions you encountered six months ago? This sentence from Shimu made Gwendolyn immediately recall memories of the scorpion-tailed lions. It was that group of lions. I remember. Dad, I remember now. Those lions were blocking me and Chris at the time, looking fierce, but then they ran away. If they hadn't run so fast, I would have skinned them and made a blanket for you. Gwendolyn pretended to swing her little fists in the air. She had no idea how powerful the scorpion-tailed lions were. She still thought they were just ordinary lions with wings. Your Majesty, are you planning to go find the scorpion-tailed lions? Sylvia asked, patting Gwendolyn's head. Yes, that group of lions has been wandering near the Dokafa Mountains recently, posing a threat to our hunting team. I have to deal with them. Shimu looked down at everyone from a high vantage point. Dad, can I come with you? I want to help you a little. Gwendolyn cutely jumped up, raising her tender little hand. Red dragons hold grudges, and Gwendolyn, with her red dragon bloodline, was no exception. Those lions had startled her when they descended from the sky. It was despicable. They needed to be taught a lesson. Stop it, little Doran. His majesty is going to do important work. You can't cause trouble for him. Sylvia stopped her daughter Gwendolyn from misbehaving. This wasn't a game. It was about dealing with a threat. I understand, mom. Gwendolyn lowered her head in disappointment. She had expected her parents to refuse, but there was still a glimmer of hope in her heart. It's okay, Sylvia. If little Doran really wants to go, then let's go together. Really? To the surprise of Sylvia and Gwendolyn, Shimu unexpectedly agreed to Gwendolyn's request this time. Joy spread across Gwendolyn's face. It was the first time her father had allowed her to leave the dragon's lair. Gwendolyn didn't know that Shimu secretly allowed it. How could I deceive you, little Doran? Come here. Shimu extended his dragon claw, inviting Gwendolyn to jump onto his palm. Humph, dad. You're always in the dragon's lair and rarely come out to see me. Have you forgotten that I have little wings? Gwendolyn playfully rolled her eyes at Shimu, flapping her light red wings on her back. Unlike her siblings, Gwendolyn inherited more of Shimu's bloodline, with features of a red dragon's tail, horns, wings, eyes, and scales. Ha, I almost forgot that you, little Doran, have wings to fly. Shimu couldn't help but laugh. Indeed, he had spent most of his time in the dragon's lair and neglected to check on Gwendolyn's growth. His attention had been focused on his own rest and other offspring. Sylvia, in Wen, Beth. Gwendolyn and I will temporarily leave the dragon's lair. If there's anything, just instruct Chris. Shimu instructed before leaving. Yes, your majesty. The women replied in unison. Let's go, Gwendolyn, and don't forget the giant eagles. Screech. Your majesty. We are ready. While Shimu was speaking with his family, Chris had informed Damal of the situation. Roar. Boom. The flapping of dragon wings stirred up a powerful hurricane. The crowd instinctively grabbed the nearby pillar to steady themselves and not be blown down. Wow! This is the power of dad. When can I do it too? Gwendolyn's eyes sparkled as she admired her father's figure, then flapped the dragon wings on her back to catch up. Gwendolyn's flying movements were not as intense. Her speed was noticeably slower than Westmarch's, and she couldn't catch up at all. Fortunately, Westmarch still paid attention to Gwendolyn and deliberately slowed down to let her follow. I hope little Gwendolyn and his majesty won't cause any trouble this time they go out, Sylvia prayed. Don't worry, sister Sylvia. Little Gwendolyn is smart. She won't cause trouble for his majesty. Even if she does, what could be troublesome for his majesty the dragon king? Anna Wen teased. In the distant sky, woohoo Gwendolyn soared freely in the sky. This was her first time flying so freely in the sky. She had been confined to the dragon's lair before and had no freedom at all. Occasionally circling in the air, then diving low and taking off again, she was having a great time. She displayed her playful and mischievous nature of a child to the fullest, brimming with youthful energy. Damar. While Gwendolyn was flying ahead, Westmarch had something to instruct. You called, your majesty. Damar heard Westmarch's call and quickly flapped his wings to come to the dragon's side. After a while, alright, I understand your meaning, your majesty. 
please rest assured. Damar nodded gently. Just now, Westmarch planned to let the forest eagles and Gwendolyn face the scorpion-tailed lions first. He wanted to see how his daughter Gwendolyn would perform against the lions without his help. If a fight were to break out between them, he could intervene in time. He could also set up a prohibition magic nearby during Gwendolyn's confrontation with the lions to prevent the lions from fleeing in fear. Westmarch didn't have the energy to chase down more than 20 scorpion-tailed lions in different directions. It was safest to trap them all in his magic prohibition. Ahead, as Gwendolyn flew, she suddenly realized that her father's presence seemed to have disappeared. Ha! Huh? Dad? Damar, where did my dad go? Gwendolyn stopped flying, floating in midair, looking around. There was no trace of her father. He was just behind her a moment ago. Well, your highness Gwendolyn, his majesty still has some matters to attend to. He temporarily returned to the dragon's lair and will be back soon. Before his majesty left, he told me to make you our leader, to try to subdue the group of scorpion-tailed lions as much as possible. If they refuse to be subdued, then kill them all. Damar relayed Westmarch's words to Gwendolyn. It was clear that his majesty really liked Princess Gwendolyn. There was a feeling of grooming Princess Gwendolyn to inherit his throne. However, Damar was well aware that perhaps his majesty's lifespan was longer than Princess Gwendolyn's. Although Gwendolyn inherited the bloodline of the Red Dragon, breaking through the human lifespan limit, living easily for over a thousand years, compared to the dragons on this continent, it was still short. Pure-blooded dragons on this continent, if they have no accidents and normal metabolism, have an average lifespan of 5,000 years. Westmarch was only a hundred years old now, with a long life ahead of him. Dad is really something. He clearly said we would go together, but then he changed his mind at the last minute. Oh well, no matter what happened to Dad, since he entrusted the task to me, I'll do it. Then I will definitely not let my father down. Aren't they just a group of scorpion-tailed lions? It's a piece of cake for me. Gwendolyn, relying on being a mid-level mage and a lower-level swordsman, was not afraid of the group of scorpion-tailed lions. They had never engaged in battle before and were not sure of the true strength of the scorpion-tailed lions. The group of forest giant eagles led by Damar looked at each other, as they had never fought the scorpion-tailed lions either. They had only vaguely heard from the leader Chris that the scorpion-tailed lions were very powerful flying monsters, much stronger than their forest giant eagles. Fortunately, the Red Dragon Majesty was silently following them in the shadows, otherwise, Damar would never have dared to fool around with Princess Gwendolyn. After all, seeking out the opponent when the strengths were unequal would be seeking death. Let's go! Wait for us, Princess Gwendolyn! Gwendolyn swiftly flew forward, with the forest giant eagles following closely behind. During the flight, Damar was surprised to discover that even as adults, the forest giant eagles could barely keep up with Princess Gwendolyn's speed? Truly worthy descendants with the great bloodline of the Majesty Red Dragon. No wonder their forest giant eagles couldn't fly as fast as the giant dragon, it made sense. Near the Dokafa Mountains, a group of scorpion-tailed lions circled around the mountain walls, constantly monitoring the situation on the road below. Leader, will those humans come today? We've caught them several times already. Those humans are so clever, they shouldn't be foolish enough to come again, right? One of the scorpion-tailed lions asked the leader. The scorpion-tailed lion tribe had no names, firstly, their intelligence was limited, so they didn't understand the concept of names, and secondly, names held no meaning for them. A regular group of scorpion-tailed lions numbered only about 20, so there was no need for names. Only when they submitted to a powerful monster would that monster give them names. Let's wait a little longer today. If they don't show up, we'll leave this place. The scorpion-tailed lion leader was not entirely sure if the humans would appear. Since they had been guarding this human trade route, they had captured a total of over a dozen human caravans. Previously, a patrolling scorpion-tailed lion had discovered a group of humans here and inspected the destroyed wagons and bloodstains left behind. It seemed that the humans had learned of the existence of the scorpion-tailed lions. If it were him, knowing that a dragon that ate scorpion-tailed lions was nearby, he would definitely leave without hesitation. There was no way he would continue to stay there. Leader! A group of flying giant eagles is coming! Just as the scorpion-tailed lion leader was considering whether to leave, another scorpion-tailed lion suddenly approached and shouted loudly. In an instant, all the scorpion-tailed lion's attention was drawn to the nearby area. They saw over a hundred forest giant eagles flying towards them. When they noticed the small black shadow at the front of the forest giant eagles, the scorpion-tailed lion leader's pupils constricted. Leader, it looks like we won't be able to eat humans today. How about we eat some eagles instead? The scorpion-tailed lion's eyes lit up. They had been worried about not being able to eat humans today and had gone hungry. But now, a group of giant eagles had come to them. 
The scorpion-tailed lions were nearly twice the size of the forest giant eagles, and with their different structures, the scorpion-tailed lions were much heavier. Facing ten forest giant eagles, a single scorpion-tailed lion had no fear. Even if they couldn't win, they could retreat unscathed. The size of monsters was an important source of strength. Quiet. The scorpion-tailed lion leader's lion eyes shifted, lost in thought. Hey, big lion, are you surprised to see me this time? Gwendolyn stood confidently with her hands on her hips, flapping the dragon wings behind her. Compared to half a year ago, the dragon aura on Gwendolyn's body has become even stronger, with a hint of the unique pressure belonging to dragons. Scorpion-tailed lions are not entirely lions, instead, their faces are human-like, with a large mouth full of teeth like a shark's, in multiple rows. Curved bone spurs grow on the mane around their necks. Their hind legs are more like a lion's, while their front legs are evolved claws resembling human hands, with rough and sharp claws, almost indistinguishable from humans. They have a pair of dragon wings on their backs, with bone spurs extending from their neck vertebrae all the way to their tails. The tips of their tails are covered with sharp bone spurs. They can be described as extremely ugly. Are you the child from half a year ago? Tell me, who is your father? The scorpion-tailed lion had already guessed that Gwendolyn was probably a descendant of a dragon, but he still wanted to hear it from her personally. Anyway, he was prepared to slip away at any time. The scorpion-tailed lion's character destined him not to dare provoke anything related to dragons. You have no right to ask about my father. I am here for one thing only whether you scorpion-tailed lions are willing to join our West Shepherd clan. Gwendolyn's childish voice echoed in the sky. Hearing the childish voice in his ears, the leader of the scorpion-tailed lions couldn't help but laugh, little one, do you think that just you alone, and the group of stupid birds behind you, can make me submit? Haha <laughs> if she weren't a dragon's offspring, we would have killed her long ago. Tisk, what's there to fear? I say, since the dragon is not here, let's just kill her and leave, flee far away. Shut up, be careful the dragon hears you, and you'll be done for. The leader of the scorpion-tailed lions sternly reprimanded his subordinates. No matter how he looked down on Gwendolyn in front of him, he dared not insult the dragon. With the dragon's vengeful nature, be careful, as he might track your scent all the way from the south of the continent to the north. Damn it! You lions are really underestimating me. Gwendolyn saw that among this group of lions, there were still some ignorant fools who dared to speak ill of her father. Angrily, she reached out her hand, and the wise forest giant eagle behind her immediately handed her the magic wand. I will let you know the consequences of speaking ill of my father. The magic wand in her hand spun around, and the tip of the magic crystal instantly absorbed the purple elemental particles of thunder from the sky and earth. This caused the originally white magic crystal to emit a purple halo. Crackling sounds lightning intertwined around the magic crystal, surrounding Gwendolyn's whole body, making her clothes and hair move without wind. Lightning shock. An obscure dragon language came out of Gwendolyn's cherry lips. The first magic she cast on the scorpion-tailed lion was the dragon language magic she had worked hard to learn. Boom! A lightning bolt, over five meters wide, suddenly shot out from the magic crystal, catching the scorpion-tailed lions off guard. They had never expected the magical power of this little girl in front of them to be so great. Ah! One of the scorpion-tailed lions couldn't dodge and was directly hit by the lightning bolt. A burst of white smoke emanated from his body, his yellow eyes rolled back, his mind blank, and he fainted, falling helplessly from the sky to the ground. Bang! Fortunately, the height was not very high, coupled with the branches cushioning the fall, the scorpion-tailed lion did not die, but broke a few bones. How about it, stinky lion, is my strength enough to talk to you now? Gwendolyn said disdainfully. She displayed the proud and domineering character of a red dragon to the fullest. Roar do you know what you're doing? The leader of the scorpion-tailed lions and the group of scorpion-tailed lions all let out terrifying low growls towards Gwendolyn. When Damel and the group of forest giant eagles heard this, they felt a bit panicked. The oppressive feeling of the scorpion-tailed lions was not imaginary. Gwendolyn, on the other hand, acted as if nothing was wrong, completely ignoring the aura emanating from the scorpion-tailed lions. Oomph, of course I know what I'm doing, I'm upholding the dignity of my father as a dragon, Gwendolyn snorted. You. Just as the leader of the scorpion-tailed lions was about to angrily scold Gwendolyn. Well said, little Gwendolyn. Tell me, you group of little flying cats, what do you want to do? Hurt my daughter? Boom! A substantial pressure swept down from above like a tide, feeling the pressure above their heads. The scorpion-tailed lions felt as if they were being crushed by a mountain, their bodies, which could have balanced in midair, lost their balance in an instant. Some of the more fragile scorpion-tailed lions even fell from the sky, following the footsteps of their companion. The scorpion-tailed lion leader gritted his teeth, feeling a chill in his heart when he looked up and saw the red dragon. How could a red dragon appear here? 
Why was there no previous discovery? According to the scorpion-tailed lion leader's thoughts, even if the red dragon were to come, he would have been able to smell the scent of the red dragon before it approached him. But now he didn't smell anything, not even a hint of the red dragon's presence above him. You. You misunderstand. Great dragon. The scorpion-tailed lion leader was so scared that he fled at full speed, not caring at all about the well-being of his group, he was about to lose his life, who cared about the rest of the tribe. Flapping the dragon wings on his back, he quickly flew away. But just as he flew less than 10 meters away, he suddenly found a magical wall blocking his path. Above the magical wall were inscriptions of obscure and incomprehensible dragon language characters. Dragon magic. The scorpion-tailed lions couldn't speak dragon language, but they recognized those characters as the language of the dragons. Where do you think you're going, little lion? Westmu landed slowly in front of Gwendolyn. He had long been wary of the scorpion-tailed lions. He had made preparations in advance, setting up prohibition magic in the surroundings. Unless he voluntarily left, or unless someone's power could surpass his, the prohibition magic could not be broken. Hearing the dragon's words, the leader of the scorpion-tailed lions turned around in fear, tears in his eyes. You. You really misunderstood, great dragon, I. I really have no ill intentions towards you. The scorpion-tailed lion leader swore that he had never spoken ill of the dragon. His fear of the dragon had been instilled in him since childhood by his parents. Facing a dragon for the first time today, the scorpion-tailed lion leader realized that a real dragon was even more terrifying than what his parents had described. This terrifying body, the sky-obscuring dragon wings, were not something their scorpion-tailed lions could handle. You indeed have not spoken ill or had ill intentions, but Gwendolyn is my daughter. What attitude did you just show towards my daughter? The dragon's majestic eyes narrowed slightly his sharp gaze like a sword piercing the heart of the scorpion-tailed lion leader. I, I, I apologize to you here, it was my mistake, I was too ignorant, dear me, how could I be so foolish? The scorpion-tailed lion leader nodded apologetically to Gwendolyn, and not only that, he used his strong front paws to frantically slap his own face. Faced with the dragon, he didn't even have the courage to fight. Dad, you're amazing. Gwendolyn's eyes shone with admiration. Actually, just now she tried to imitate her father, Shimu, and release her own dragon power to the scorpion lion group, but unfortunately, she failed. Her own dragon power was still far from enough, and she posed no threat to the scorpion lions at all. Listening to Gwendolyn's praise, Shimu couldn't help but feel that his daughter's short sentence was worth more than a thousand words from Chris. Chris, your majesty, you are amazing, you are noble. Do you want to live? Scorpion lions. Shimu said. Yes. Yes. I want to, the scorpion lion leader replied anxiously. Who wouldn't want to live? The lifespan of scorpion lions is much longer than that of the jackal people, but without a short 35 years, their lifespan is similar to that of humans, usually reaching 70 or 80 years. The scorpion lion leader is only 30 years old, in his prime. There is still plenty of time left, so how could he be willing to die at this moment? It has to be said that the scorpion lions are a bit stupid. If it were any other slightly more intelligent monster, they would remember what Gwendolyn said before, that Shimu wanted to subdue their scorpion lion group. Now, to survive, they naturally had to express their submission to Shimu. If you want to submit to me, join my clan, become a member of my clan, I can spare your lives. Shimu thought the scorpion lion leader in front of him was quite stupid. If this level of intelligence could become a leader, it meant that the other scorpion lions were even dumber. But there was no choice, after all. The scorpion lions were strong, stronger than the forest giant eagles, which could increase the strength of his aerial forces. Submit to you? I'm willing. I'm willing. Of course, I'm willing. The scorpion lion leader's originally fearful face suddenly turned into joy. Joining the red dragon's clan was like a pie falling from the sky for him. Why are the scorpion lions afraid of dragons? It's because they have a pair of dragon wings but no dragon blood in their bodies. Other dragon species despise them, even considering the existence of scorpion lions as a stain on the dignity of the great dragons. Dragon wings can only grow on creatures with dragon blood. However, Shimu didn't care about these details for now. He would first make his own Shimu clan stronger before considering those things. After the scorpion lion leader, representing the scorpion lion group, swore allegiance to Shimu, this scorpion lion group officially joined the Shimu clan. They became members of the Shimu clan. Now that you have become my vassals, I naturally have to give you a name. The scorpion lion leader had no name, so Shimu thought of giving him one for future command. It wouldn't be practical to keep calling him scorpion lion leader all the time, right? Yes, your majesty. The scorpion lion leader and the scorpion lions all landed in the forest below. The companions with broken bones were helped up by the uninjured scorpion lions. 
It was just broken legs and feet, the wings were fine and could be repaired slowly when they flew back to the dragon's nest. From today, your name will be Enduna. After thinking for a while, Shimu gave the scorpion lion leader, Enduna, this name. The name was taken from the name of a lion leader in a past life, and since the scorpion lion is a lion and a leader, Shimu thought and gave it this name. He hoped Enduna would not disappoint this name. Enduna? I understand, your majesty the red dragon. From now on, my name will be Enduna. Enduna shouted in response. When he shouted his name, he was also telling his people that from now on, call me Enduna, the leader. Stinky lion, my dad gave you a name, your luck is really good. Gwendolyn said irritably. Up to now, the only people named by her father were herself and her siblings. This lion's luck was really good. Yes, your highness Gwendolyn, thank you for the name bestowed by his majesty the red dragon. I, Enduna, will spend my whole life repaying it. Enduna prostrated on the ground. He was not as eloquent as Chris, the only words he could say were words of gratitude. If he had to say something similar to what Chris would say, he probably couldn't even think of it if he burned his brain. Alright, little Gwendolyn, no need to say more. Return to the dragon's lair, I need to explain things clearly to Enduna and Chris. Suddenly, West Shepard felt a bit nostalgic for Chris. It was quite uncomfortable to listen to Enduna speak hesitantly. Let's go. Go home. Dragon's lair boom the figure of the red dragon returned to the lair, casting a huge shadow over everyone. Behind him followed a group of monsters, including the newly tamed scorpion-tailed lions. Is that a scorpion-tailed lion? Chris, with sharp eyes, noticed the figure of the scorpion-tailed lion. It seemed that his majesty's plan had succeeded, and the aerial forces of the West Shepherd clan were about to become stronger. This was a good thing for the West Shepherd clan. Chris. Gwendolyn flapped her little wings and landed in front of Chris. Oh, dear Princess Gwendolyn, your dazzling figure. All right, enough, don't say so much nonsense. My father has something to discuss with you, so speak to him instead of me, to avoid making my father unhappy if you're late. Gwendolyn waved her hand impatiently. She stopped Chris from flattering her, although she actually quite liked to hear it on normal days. With her red dragon bloodline, she also enjoyed Chris's praise. But today was different, her father seemed to be in a hurry, calling Chris to see him as soon as he returned. To prevent Chris from being punished, Gwendolyn had to let Chris go quickly. Thank you, Princess Gwendolyn, for your reminder. This humble dog will go and come back. After hearing Gwendolyn's words, Chris immediately set off towards the dragon's lair at a fast pace. Dragon's lair Great Red Dragon Majesty. Good evening, congratulations on your return. I knew that with your majestic and domineering figure, you are like a red sun that makes people unable to help but follow your will. As soon as Chris entered the lair, he saw the scorpion-tailed lion lying in front of Lord West Shepherd. This scorpion-tailed lion was noticeably larger, and Chris immediately speculated that this was probably the leader of the scorpion-tailed lion group. Chris, let me introduce you, he is the leader of the scorpion-tailed lion group, named Enduna, West Shepherd said. Hello, Chief Chris, his majesty mentioned you before my arrival. From the looks of it, we met about half a year ago, right? Fortunately, Enduna's memory wasn't too bad and he immediately recognized Chris as the captain of the hyena hunting team from six months ago. Hello, Chief Enuna, regardless of what happened between us before, from now on, we are warriors of the West Shepherd clan, loyal followers of His Majesty West Shepherd. Chris harbored no hatred towards Enuna. Apart from the threat to his life in the past, there had been no substantial confrontation between them. There was no need to hold a grudge. Chris, do you know why I called you here? West Shepherd asked with interest. The great thoughts of the dragon, how could a humble dog like me guess, just as mortals can never fathom the will of the gods, it is impossible for me to know. Chris prostrated on the ground, looking up at the massive figure of West Shepherd. You are quite clever. West Shepherd felt that Chris had probably guessed it, but he didn't say it out loud. It was to maintain the dignity of the dragon. Smart and unassuming, these were Chris's rare qualities. I came to find you for the people of the town of Jakardo.